So good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to LogWeb uh, 2022. This is the 12th edition of the workshop that we've been running for quite a long time in different settings and with uh, different themes and topics. Um, for today, we have a half day workshop planned uh, around all the topics of location, geospatial analytics, uh, web systems, and all that. And we have the first session, Digital Geographies and Geospatial Media, with the keynote of Stefano de Sabata from Leicester University. Uh, and after that, we have uh, the first paper um, on exploiting geodata to improve image recognition with deep learning. And then we have a coffee break. And in the afternoon session, we then have two more uh, presentations of papers and a discussion session of any open issues or future challenges, questions from the audience, uh, discussions within ourselves, why location is interesting, what the open challenges are, or what the specific things are that we want to explore further, where do we see the topic going, and anything we want to do for uh, the workshop in, in following years, and basically just exchange some experiences of our work with with the topic and also the experiences from having seen uh, the papers today. Uh, that should be enough for the introduction. I would like to hand over then directly to the keynote, um, which is about everyday digital geographies. I'm really excited to listen to that and hopefully also have an interesting discussion then afterwards. Thanks a lot. Uh, Steph, floor is yours. Thanks. Thanks so much for the for the introduction as well. Um, so as as we were saying, that's, uh, I hope uh, we we're discussing this just before um, started. I hope to really have sort of like a, a discussion more than a sort of like a one hour lecture. Um, so if there are any questions, especially because it's a sort of like a small workshop, uh, please do interrupt me, and I'm happy to have a, a discussion. Um, I'm gonna paste again. Um, in the chat, if you're interested, these are my uh, slides, which are online, so you can have a look. I'm gonna now share my screen so that you can see um, where I am at. Okay, I hope you can see my screen. Um, yes. Perfect. Um, right, so, uh, well, again, thanks for, for inviting me. It's, it's really uh, a pleasure and very interesting to um, to be at the World War Work Conference. Um, I'm gonna start, so the, what I want to talk about today um, is sort of like a different angle on basically the same things that sort of like we have all been doing and we're all been interested in um, sort of like the interaction between the, the web uh, and digital content and location, but taking them from a different angle, or at least starting from a different angle. So I promise, I really promise, I'm going to get to the deep learning part, OK? Uh, nowadays, you can't really escape deep learning. Um, but I want to start from um, a different angle, which is the angle of um, digital geographies. Uh, and this is where geographers um, sort of like study the digital and the digi digital geography is mostly um, led by um, uh, human geographers. So these are not computer scientists, they're not GI scientists, uh, but they're really people who specialize in uh, human geography. Um, and what they sort of like discuss or talk about in their work is what they refer to as uh, the digital, okay? Uh, so these are a couple of quotes um, from, uh, well, the first one is from a paper of mine uh, with Mark Graham, uh, who is a digital geographer. And, and then there is a quote from a recent book on digital geographies, which sort of like start to uh, pan out the discipline. The first one says that information has always had the geography. Um, it's from somewhere, about somewhere, it evolves and it is transformed somewhere, is mediated by natural infrastructure and technology, all of world exists uh, in a physical and material space. So this is sort of like trying to encapsulate how um, it's not just uh, the digital content having uh, a component which is referring to a location. Okay, this is mostly what we have been doing uh, in sort of like all the 
papers that you've probably seen in uh, the LOCWAC um, um, workshop, but also, you know, if you go to any GI science conference or um, location-based services or um, all the VGI paper is looking at internet content and looking at where this content is about, right? Um, what this quote is trying to highlight is that it's not just the content is referring to a place, but also all the content is processed and it has a much stronger connection to the physical location than what we normally expect. So it's just, you know, things about the, the digital geographer think about, you know, where are the server that are processing this kind of information? Where is the information being created? Not just where information is about, but where it's created and why, okay? So trying to look at the relationship between digital content and location in a bit of a deep, deeper uh, way, okay? Um, and then there is the other quote that say that it's now obvious that to state that digital phenomena have radically transformed every other human life. Digital platforms are uh, changing what constitute the fields, okay? So this is, uh, a quote basically saying, um, we as human geographers, we need to go into the digital as our field of um, sort of like field of or research. Okay, so the digital platform become, you know, like a city where geographers go in and try to study space and place um, in this case in the digital. Okay, so what I want to talk about uh, today is everyday digital geographies. Um, and I'm gonna sort of like make uh, three sort of like statements or I wanted to, to make three points. Um, so the first one is that we need to make room for quote unquote the everyday and I will come to what the everyday means uh, later on. But basically uh, I would argue that most of the, the papers that we've been working on is being about events being about big things, you know, hashtag earthquake uh, was one of the title, one of the first and possibly more cited uh, papers about this kind of things or like study of Twitter. We need to move forward and make room for something which is more mundane. There is something interesting going on in the more mundane part of the web uh, that talks about place. Um, and I'm going to argue that we've been mostly working, doing our own uh, quantitative work, um, but I also would uh, to argue that we need to really work in a mixed method approach. We need to collaborate with our colleagues that work into human geography with more qualitative approaches. Um, and I think that there is a lot to be gained from a strict collaboration with them. Uh, and finally, that um, when, when we will get to the, the more computational and deep learning part, I really think that we need to start, um, I mean, not that it's never been done, but I think there is need to be more space for uh, multimodal analysis. So going beyond the text, um, good looking at text uh, images together and so on and so forth. And I think one of the papers, I had a sneak peek of some of the papers, I think uh, one of the papers at least um, does that. Uh, um, before moving on, I just want to, you know, mention uh, the people that, you know, without whom this work, this all this work, not being possible. So Andrea Balatore, um, Katie Bennett, and Zoe Gardner here, Lester, Mark Graham at Oxford, and Peng Yon Hu, uh, who is now at Singapore, uh, but it was one of my PhD students. Um, and I want to say this is not just people who I've collaborated with, um, but also people who um, who's thinking about geography, whose work has severely <laughs> impacted my own way of thinking, let's put it this way. Uh, in particular, you know, I've been working with Mark uh, and Katie and Zoe, who are human geographers, and their perspective on uh, the digital has significantly um, sort of like shaped the way I think about what I do uh, in terms of analyzing location in the web and uh, BGI nowadays. Um, so. I would like to start from, again, uh, a sneak peek on digital geography. And again, I don't know, have you, I don't know how many of you have ever sort of like read a paper on digital geographies written by a human geographers. Have you, any, anyone has sort of like looked into this kind of literature? 
No? Okay. I have to admit that I rather peaked uh, for specific things that I was interested in, uh, like how Wikipedia is used. I also did some work before of what other people think about that have a bit more of a grasp of the topic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and also something about mobility, where there's a lot of previous work that doesn't always translate to the quite well strong but very biased uh, real time online data then that we mm. might have about mobility and uh, aspects like that. Yeah. Anyone else? As if anyone else wants to contribute again, I, I don't want this to be too much of a lecture. I will be. I will likely be over time anyway. So, uh, if you. All right, so we'll move on. So um, digital geographies as being, again, if you have the chance, there is this book that I mentioned at the beginning is called Digital Geographies. I would, you know, have a look. I think it's interesting to see things from a different perspective. It gives you, uh, again, different perspective on what you're doing. Um, and th there are different definitions of what digital geography might mean. What uh, using digital geographies here is to refer to doing geographies of the digital so looking at digital content and doing human geography about it basically which is distinct by from you know um other definition which uh is looking more at uh you know producing geographies through digital and the, the geographies produced by the digital and again don't have really have the time to look into this but again if this sounds strange i think it's you know give it a go. I think it's quite interesting. It's a bit of a mind, mind bending, but I think it's quite interesting to see different perspective. So in particular, when I was working with Mark Graham at the Oxford Internet Institute, we look at, you know, things like where people have access to the internet from, okay? So we all know that, uh, you know, not everybody has access to the internet is growing, okay? But the real thing is, what is not just that we need to be aware of the biases we all work with this kind of data we all know that there are biases but the real question is what are these biases how are these biases related to global inequalities for instance okay uh, or gender inequalities i don't know how many of you have worked with OpenStreetMap, but if you have ever opened a paper on OpenStreetMap, you probably know that uh you know over 95% of OpenStreetMap contributors are men, okay? Uh, Zoe and I uh, have worked on this and she did an amazing survey of how and why women contribute to OpenStreetMap, okay? And you can look at how they're different kind of contribution. And this kind of diverse and sort of like different and biased participation produce a, um, a biased representativeness, okay? So again, we pro you've probably all seen um, papers that discuss that there are biases in um, Twitter and Wikipedia. Uh, the real question is where, okay, and how and why? Um, and you can look at this and say, okay, I know there is a bias, let's work with what we have, um, but you can also look at, you know, a different scale. So what was a show before was sort of like a global overview of sort of like bias access to the internet. This is a more localized, this is London, uh, and look at what places are actually represented, okay? So what is the representativeness of Twitter or Wikipedia, okay? So which places, what are their characteristics of the places that are actually represented on social media you can see and you know you can see things that you probably expect like you know most the most the, the places where for instance twitter is very much present and there is a lot of twitter data production are places where there is a high percentage of people between 30 and 44 right um and i think this is quite interesting there is some interesting human geography that you can do there uh, and especially if you want to sit down and look at how this changes over time so there are papers um sort of like at this intersection between geoscience and human geography, I say, okay, if we know that these data sets are biased, are biased, if there is a change in this data set, okay, so if suddenly there are more tweets produced in an area, is, does it mean that the underlying demographic have changed, okay? So there are some interesting questions that you can, uh, you, you can explore there, okay, not using somehow the bias 
to actually understand what's going on. Is there a new, I don't know, new tourist area coming up or is, you know, uh, a new area is becoming hipster and, you know, people are going there and tweeting about it, okay? So what is going on is just beyond uh, sort of like just looking at the bias, but sort of like exploiting this bias, okay? Um, we did some related work in, in Los Angeles as well. You can see also how a lot of these biases that we normally talk about in a very generalized way are actually very localized. So the kind of biases that you see in London are not the same that you see in um, in, in LA, for instance. Um, we we didn't see any uh, any sort of like bias based on uh, ethnicity in London, but there was a strong um, strong bias based on race uh, in LA. So you know all these biases have their own geographies. And this is something really important. This is part of what digital geography is about, like studying the actual geographies of these biases, not just recognizing that they're there. But again, all of this has mostly been about um, sort of like the um, events or is being about trying to relate um, the this kind of digital content to uh, big picture, um, sort of like big picture topics and big picture events. So what I want to talk about today is really um, the everyday, okay? Um, and by everyday, um, I mean something which has a, a kind of a clear definition in human geography. Uh, and again, I would like to, to use this quote, which I think is, is quite funny, but um, it's, I think it gives the idea, right? So amid the Ridley Scott images of war cities, uh, the writing about skyscraper uh, fortresses and the boulevard vision of hyperspace, I mean, uh, this is, we're talking about 1994 here, um, most people still live in places like Harston and West Brom. Uh, much of the life of many people still consists of waiting in the bus shelter with your shopping uh, for a bus that never comes, okay? So this is um, during Marseille highlighting back in the 90s, how, you know, yes, we, human geography at the time was doing, you know, mostly, uh, again, geography of big events, geographies of, um, global globalization, uh, the borders and so on and so forth, looking at the cities, a lot of, you know, gentrification studies around London and New York and so on and so forth. But these are sort of like topics that yes, impact us, but a lot of us don't live there. Okay, I didn't grow up in a big city. I didn't, I never quite, I really lived in a big city, um, apart from Zurich, um, which again, it's, is not is not you know is not is not as big as New York. Um, it's most of our daily life is about you know waiting for the coffee to to you know to brew, um, and is about waiting for the bus or you know get stuck in traffic. And there is an interesting type of geography to be there, and an interesting um, reflection to be made about where a lot of those events, how those, those events relate to our own understanding of space and place um, and what, what impact they have on our daily life. Um, so why is the everyday important? Um, we need to uh, look at the everyday, um, both because it challenges our own understanding uh, of academic knowledge, okay? Uh, it challenges what we think about in, as important, okay? So going beyond, again, the earthquakes, the flooding, the, um, um, I don't know, the volcanic eruptions, okay? Uh, and see actually what uh, impact, um, what, what, what are the geographies of our everyday, in, in particular in, um, in the field of um, location and the web, both geographic information, social media, and so on and so forth. What are the discussions that are going on, sort of like about the everyday on this platform? Okay? It's not all about the flooding and, and the earthquake. Um, and these everyday interactions that we can see on the web, okay, can be very important in showing what are the social inequality and exclusions that we live in the everyday, or at least that some of us um, live in the everyday. Um, and also, 
let me tell you, you will see later on, they can really challenge our own methods. And they are a sneak peek on the later on discussion on um, deep learning um, and sort of like, you know, even things like uh, topic modeling, if you've ever done a LDA or B term topic modeling, something like that, you know, if you have clear topics, if, if your tweets talk about, you know, the earthquake, you will find the earthquake. If you if your topics, if your tweets just contain everyday chit chat on on Twitter, okay, people wanting to go to, you know, have a sandwich or, you know, just saying hi, good morning, everybody. Do this topic modeling actually uh, tell you something? Is that actually a method? Is a is it a valid method? Do we need something different? Okay. Um, and in order to um, sort of like discuss um, and sort of like give you a sneak peek on my work uh, in collaboration with um, especially Zoe and Katie uh, about everyday geographies and the digital, we're going to talk about um, our mapping multiculture um, project. This is this is a, an ongoing project. Uh, well, it's kind it's kind of finished uh, our paper our first paper we're gonna uh, mention later on is being literally put online um on the on the journal literally yesterday afternoon um, so we will find the link because it's being finally published but this is a, a project that is basically finishing now so there are still quite a lot of things uh going on but the overall idea of the project was to try and um see what is um, what are the digital experiences of uh, people um, of Leicester as a multicultural city? So Leicester is a very peculiar city um, in a way that is the only minority majority city in the UK. Uh, London is a bit peculiar, so let's put London aside. Is the only ma minority majority city, which means that. Um, about between 51 and 55 percent, depending on which statistics you, you take, of the people in Leicester, so the majority of people in Leicester are from what is usually referred to as a minority background. So if you take the white, white British population here in Leicester is around 44, 45 percent, something like that. Um, it is a very multicultural space. Um, and is also a place where um, can be referred to uh, or can be understood as relatively segregated in a way that there are areas of the cities where most of the people who live there are from a white British background. There are areas of the city where uh, it where mostly people living there are from uh, Indian heritage and so on and so forth. But at the same time, there are areas which are very diverse um, there are areas where everybody comes, like the city center. Okay, at the same time, there is there is a question about you know what is multiculture and how is multiculture lived. Okay, so there are sort of like again going back to the discussion I was having before. There are the big discussion about multiculture and the big events about multiculture, but there is also like an everyday way of living multiculture and sort of like they're rubbing along as some, some of my colleagues describing of people from different culture inhabiting the same space and inhabiting the same routines, not necessarily, you know, sitting down and having a discussion about ethnicity, race, colonialism, but just living their everyday life in a place which is multicultural. Okay, so this is some of the things that we wanted to explore in this project. And again, we decided to try and have a very um, open, sort of like blue sky thinking, um, very open um, approach to mix quantitative and qualitative methods. Okay, so we started from uh, some interviews uh, and we wanted to have an idea of what young people in the city, how they leave the city. Um, and we wanted to use that as a starting point to actually do the um, sort of like the more quantitative social media analysis, okay? But then we also used some of the analysis that we came from the social media to then inform the 
uh, qualitative analysis of the interview. So it was, and I think this is sort of like one of the strengths of the project. It was a very uh, sort of like very fluid, very um, open and continuously changing project. It was not like, okay, you do your own thing with the quantitative, I do my own thing with the quantitative. We see each other in two years time and compare notes. It was really an ongoing discussion um, as I will show uh, in a minute. Um, and it was sort of like part of the project was also this sort of like critical reflection about what is that we were doing? How are we sort of like combining um, our own, uh, our own um, methods, okay? Um, and the most interesting and quite surprising results uh, that came out of this project is the paper that exactly was just published yesterday, uh, which whose title is Let's Go Nandos, um, which, you know, of all of the things that I was thinking about when I was, we started the project, Nando's was definitely not sort of like on my horizon. Um, given the audience, I'm not entirely sure whether you know what Nando's is. I didn't know before coming to the UK. Uh, so Nando's is a chain, restaurant chain, um, is sort of like, uh, it's difficult to describe this. Um, it started in South Africa and it has this kind of like, uh, is mostly, you know, uh, spicy chicken and hamburgers and rice, this kind of food, right? Is a very um, sort of like the, the sort of like the heritage is very much sort of like this mix of um, Indian and South African traditions about how to cook uh, food. Um, and it's something that you find here everywhere is relatively cheap in the sense that you know this is the kind of things where if you are if you have a few pounds if you, if you are in your you know 15 or 16 and you have a few pounds in your pocket you can go with your friends and have uh chicken you know spicy chicken and a bit of rice and you know um free refills coke and so on and so forth so it's like this kind of place um and and again it's this is not something that you know i don't think anybody has ever written a you know, paper on a Twitter analysis of, you know, tweets about Nando's. Again, mostly we talk about earthquakes and flooding and so on and so forth. Um, but so why we came to Nando's? Well, again, we run these interviews with, um, you know, kids 16, 15, 17 years old, this kind of age, so by high school age, um, in schools here. Um, it was also interesting because we did this using VR, so this was pre-pandemic, so we went to the schools with um, Google Earth, uh, sort of like um, Oculus Rift and Google Earth VR, okay, and kids would go into the VR and sort of like take us around the city, sort of like a walk interview, but in virtual reality. It was also interesting because a lot of those... Leicester being a multicultural city, uh, a lot of these kids have a very diverse background. So at one point we were around Leicester and then we would say, oh, yes, but, you know, over the summer I go to, you know, this place in the Caribbean where my grandma lives and they take us to the Caribbean, show us around where they go and where they play football and so on and so forth. And despite people having a really a wide range of backgrounds and experiences. One of the things we noticed is that basically everybody, one of the places that everybody, you know, people that age was mentioning uh, was Nando's, okay? Uh, and so we, we went, okay, let's, let's go have a look at how, you know, what people say about Nando's on social media. This is the kind of everyday discussion. Um, and it was interesting because again, we, I started from about 1 million tweets, uh, 1 million geolocated tweets in Leicester between uh, 2018 and 2019. So this was my initial data set. This sort of like this kind of biggish data set that you, you know, very frequently work in our own field. Um, and, you know, if you start with 1 million tweets, um, the, I'm not sure whether you can see my, my mouse, but you know, we ended up finding something around 391 tweets about Nando's. Okay? So this is not one of the topics that you will naturally be drawn towards um, in terms of like doing a quantitative analysis. Uh, 391 tweets over a million is clearly not uh, sort of like the big, you know, the big topic that you would choose. 
but it was quite interesting. And what we did, well, we started with a qualitative analysis. So um, well, we do a quantitative analysis, you know, word cloud, like you can see here, uh, you know, people just wanting to have a cheeky chicken and cheeky, cheeky Nando's chicken is something that if you, if you look at Twitter, but generally speaking, how people discuss it by Nando's is like one of those, it's like going to McDonald's, something not really healthy that you, but you can do because it's nice. Um, and this is the kind of, the kind of things that sort of like, um, my colleagues in human geography are interested in. So what is the everyday multicultural experience that people um, have, for instance, when they go to Nandas, okay? And through their qualitative analysis of tweets, so they literally sit down and look at the tweets and the discussion that were going on on Twitter, uh, they could highlight some of the key aspects, things like chain restaurants being what is usually referred to in their literature as a third place. So this is not home, this is not work school, this is a third place uh, where you, you can go and be sort of like outside of your normal uh, working environment or home environment, and you can experience other people. And you don't necessarily have to interact, but you can experience. And they, you know, um, they were, they highlighted an attention to uneventfulness. So, you know, people just tweeting about waiting in line at Nando's, okay? Okay, not very eventful, but part of the discussion, there was uh, tweets about what they call uncivil attention. So people having, you know, pretty nasty comments about other people at Nando's and what they were eating and so on and so forth. And especially, especially when it comes to, to, to human geography, the use of Nando's in Twitter discussion as a way of cultural identification. So, you know, you identify yourself by the way you talk about Nandos, okay? And trying to create connection with other people across distance through a discussion of Nandos. I mean, I, would, I, I don't have um, a lot of time, so I really, um, you know, go have a look at the paper. It's actually quite interesting to see how people from a completely different discipline look at Twitter data and use Twitter data to understand something about everyday multiculturalism in this particular case. Um, but then there is actually, you know, if if I now start switching side, okay, I'm probably a bit late in my presentation, but let's say this is halfway through my presentation. Um, the let's say that um, I switch side, I start thinking more again as a, you know. My background is in computer science, um, sort of like a more of a quantitative, a scientist, as you say. And you say, okay, well, you know, that's all nice and fine, but you know, what what we can what can we do with 391 tweets? What that does mean? Doesn't mean anything. It's just you know, 391 tweets. It's not a lot. We can derive any grand theory. We can derive any um, anything really from this small amount of tweets. Um, and on, one, on the one hand, this is not really the point. At the other, at the other hand, there is an interesting, um, an, an interesting um, intersection here where we can say, okay, we can't really say much with 391 tweets, but also um, if we look at 1 million tweets, most of the time what we do with 1 million tweets is not quite so meaningful either, okay? So there is a problem here, uh, which I think is one of the key messages, I think, uh, of what I'm trying to present here about uh, from this keynote, is that yes, qualitative approach are very interesting because you can really have a nuanced um, understanding of what's going on in an online discussion, okay? Uh, you can sit down and read a Wikipedia article and really pick out the kind of discourses and the kind of assumptions that people have when writing Wikipedia articles. But it's very resource intensive, okay? So among, if you look at any of the papers that we do, even if you want to do a very, very simple, um, a very simple coding uh, of tweets, just very simple labeling, it takes a lot of work. Uh, and I generally speaking, you know, unless you're creating a sort of like a very general, um, you know, benchmark, uh, if you're doing a small study on something, 
maybe you can label a few thousand tweets if you need that. Uh, otherwise, you're going to use things like, um, you know, sentiment analysis or topic modeling, which are very blunt instruments. So you have, on the one hand, very nuanced, resource-intensive, qualitative approach. And on the other hand, you have quantitative approach, which, you know, are usually blunt instruments that really don't understand a lot about the content that they're looking at, or, you know, they're very limited, okay? So the question is, is there a middle ground? Can, can we use mixed method to generate and create a middle ground between these kinds of things, okay? Um, and you say, well, well, wait, what's the difference, okay? Um, what is the difference between what I'm trying to talk about here and, again, you, anyone, you know, writing a paper and going out and say, okay, let's take these 10,000 tweets and just label them and do a deep learning approach on that and so on and so forth. Well, the key difference here is that we are not thinking and we are not working with or aim to work with sort of like objective, generalizable labeling. I'm not trying to, I'm not talking about, you know, whether something is about an earthquake or within the earthquake, which is a sort of like an emergency or is just a comment or something like that. I'm talking about very subjective and project specific kind of labeling, okay? So I'm talking about trying to find a way to generate models and create models that can actually help human geographers, okay? I'm not trying to talk about models that can be sort of like deployed for large scale um, analysis of Twitter for companies or anything like that. I'm talking about doing human geography um, with quantitative tools, okay? So, I would like to try and think about, is there a way that we can um, create nuanced, large scale quantitative models? Probably the answer is no. Um, it, I'm not entirely sure it's feasible, probably not. But the question is, let's, you know, the point is let's try, okay? Um, so how do we do that, okay? So first of all, in this, in this project in particular, um, my colleagues were interested in emotion, okay? So emotion um, in context, so emotion expressed about multicultural living in Leicester, okay? So what they did is um, look at a sample of tweets, um, around 3,000, 4,000 tweets in total, and do not sort of like a labeling, not a predefined labeling, but just a general labeling as you would do in what is normally uh, in qualitative and as is normally for as coding, okay? So they use the term code to, ref to, to be the same as what we normally refer to as label, okay? So they would, know, they would go down and read the, paper, read the tweets and the context of the tweets, the replies and so on and so forth, and identify sort of like what's going on in the context there uh, and the emotion that are expressed. The problem is that for those 3,000 tweets, they ended up with 50 contexts and 60 emotions. And then they come to me and say, okay, can we do sort of like, can we create a model that can learn uh, and this kind of emotions? And I say, no, that's not feasible. <laughs> if you have ever tried doing uh, any kind of deep learning or even simpler models, is not, you're never going to learn 60 labels. Okay? <laughs> no, there is no model that can provide you good results with that. So we narrow it down and we ended up with something like eight context and eight emotions. Okay? Uh, surprisingly enough, most of the tweets were uh, sort of like about joy. Uh, it's less surprising that most of them were about leisure and hobbies and so on and so forth. But we we're quite literally surprised about the positivity of uh, the tweets that we were looking at, okay, especially considering what normally is understood as going on on Twitter. Um, obviously, some of these are sort of like very highly correlated in terms of what the context and the emotion are. So, you know, mostly it's about joy uh, and leisure and so on and so forth. Maybe not a lot about, you know, uh, sadness. Uh, there is no sadness with family and friendship. So, uh, for, but, you know, it's actually quite a wide range. So what I did is I created a deep learning text classification model based on pre-trained uh, document transformers um, and try to learn separately um, the emotions and the contexts, okay? Um, this is still 
under development is still not published so um, I, yeah, we can have a discussion but i don't think i can give you uh, whatever whatever details i give you they will probably be changed in two weeks time uh, and these are some results that i got literally just yesterday uh, so these are fresh from the press um, but it's actually quite interesting how you can get some decent um, models but you know whatever you try um, and you know a lot of these tools nowadays uh, if you want to do deep learning are literally off the shelf so you can get you can do some coding um, and you get a model but then you have you know the, the number of options that you have in terms of you know um, what uh, text preprocessing you do what kind of uh, trainer you, you use and so on and so forth is just never ending so you know <laughs> but having tried a lot of different um, options um, I've, it's, this is the best results I got so far and very very rarely you get above 60 percent in terms of a score uh, and in terms of accuracy in general um, and it's obviously again using a very skewed data set as this is because this is not a constructed data set. this is a real data set with you know um real emotions caused by a human geographer who's interested in this kind of thing is not is not a benchmark you see the difference um it's very very difficult to get better than this but you can do something um and you know then what I can do is from a sample of 3,000 tweets, okay, I can go and project this to all the other 850,000 English uh, tweets. I've not gone down the rabbit hole of, you know, multilingual text classification yet. Um, and, you know, you start seeing something interesting. And again, this is results from literally yesterday. Um, and, you know, we, when we started, I, I assume, for instance, that joy and sadness are sort of like opposite but the text classification that we I, i've built so far you know you actually have quite a lot of tweets which are have high confidence in um joy but also in sadness um which is interesting because i guess again it's sometimes quite difficult even for a human to actually understand some of the contents of the tweets and actually what you see is that anticipation and sadness are quite opposite so again it's there is probably something in the way of how the tweets are actually coded um which again is not quite standardized and i think again anticipation as an emotion is possibly more distinct from sadness than joy um and you can look at things like uh, the you know where in leicester you know people are more excited or more annoyed uh, and actually quite interesting you clearly if you know a little bit about Leicester you see that the places where there is more traffic and uh, where the people are usually stuck in traffic are where people are the most annoyed um, you can also see that there are some quite some annoyed people in the physics buildings of the university I'm gonna have to look into that probably I'm gonna have to have a talk to my colleagues but then again it's um, there are two things here. First of all, is the results, which are, you know, 60% is not really great. So there is a question, how much can we trust this, this result? And again, what you would need to do is then going back and, and look again at these tweets uh, and, you know, take another sample and try to look into the results. And this is possibly what we are going to do next. But also, again, there is a problem that we are only looking at text. And text is frequently only part of the story so for the, my last possibly five minutes of talk i guess i just want to briefly mention another approach uh, which is something that i've been working on with peng yuan uh, when he was doing uh, his phd with me and the idea was to try and combine um text and images uh, as well as space in order to do the classification okay so the idea of the project was to try and exploit the, the not just the text but also the images attached to a tweet to understand a label again this was not sort of like applied an applied project as uh, mapping multiculture the mapping project I was just talking about it was more like a sort of like a test case um but also trying to understand how space itself can be used to learn 
And this is starting from the assumption that if you have two tweets, which are tweeted from the same place, there is a good chance that I've been talking about the same thing, okay? Um, and what we did, we used um, a multimodal of encoder and then a graph convolution neural network, okay? So um, we use a ResNet to process the images uh, and LL, uh, sorry, LSTM to uh, process the representations. This was now three years back. We will probably use, you know, pre-process um, transform, document transformers nowadays. Um, and then use a, uh, a core net to actually combine them into a representation that could, again, sort of like minimize the error uh, and sort of like minimize the reconstruction of both the image and text, but also maximize the correlation between the, um, the inner representation, the, uh, the, um, the features of uh, text image, the features representing text images. Uh, and then we use those um, sort of like um, features, okay? Um, at the end of the encoder, we extract that and we use that with a, a graph convolution neural network where each node of the network represents tweets and the weight on the link between the tweets represent the distance between the tweets. That allows the network to sort of like learn locally, okay? So you basically, it's, it works like an image convolution, but on a network. So the values, the, um, the feature values for a node, so for a tweet, are actually convoluted with the features um, cal calculated for nearby tweets. Then there is a question of how do you define nearby? So we tried a number of different uh, approaches, starting from sort of like just a random graph to a complete graph where all the tweets are connected to all other tweets. We tried simple, simple um, spatial distance. We look at spatial temporal distance and so on and so forth. And the best results we got were with um, sort of like using a minimum spanning tree to create a network of tweets uh, based on a sort of like three kilometer, um, three, four kilometer, depending on sort of like we, some work best for some labels, some for other, but a three, four kilometer radius to say, okay, everything which is between three kilometers is sort of like nearby. This was for London, so it's a very big place. Um, and we got some fairly good results. Um, in particular, uh, as you can see, the um, using the spatial temporal, um, the spatial temporal representation of tweets uh, actually give us much better results than just looking at space. Uh, because obviously, if tweets are sort of like also uh, sort of like generated in about the same time, uh, that also probably means they are more or less talking about the same event or the same topic. Um, again, whether this will work very well or less well for more um, everyday tweets, again, we don't really know because although this was not um, used on sort of like a big event, again, the, the fact that space, the spatial temporal component plays such a good, uh, such a big role in giving better results indicates that it's probably, um, it's probably, um, again, picking up events, okay? So you can see how the aspatial, um, on the second line, the aspatial, look, look, looking at image in text, produces values which are close to the model that I was showing before. So we are just above uh, 60%. Then when you start including space and time, then you start getting much better results. But again, this is probably picking up some kind of events. Um, and again, if we're looking at everyday tweets, is that going to work? So I am at the end of the talk. I hope this was somehow interesting. Um, some some take-home messages, okay? First of all, again, I hope I maybe not convince you, but I gave you sort of like a different perspective on the idea of uh, looking at the everyday and why the everyday is interesting, but also creates new challenges. Um, that, um, you know, working with um, our human geography colleagues can generate some new and interesting projects. Um, and again, that if we start looking at multimodal 
um, analysis. So trying to include images, but also include space and time into the analysis, we can get much better results. Um, also be aware, okay, mixed methods really require dialogue. You really need to go in, you know, uh, and with an open mind and try to understand where your colleagues are coming from and sit down probably multiple times and trying to understand what they mean with the words that they use. Like they talk about codes, don't is not the same as we what we say code is. So it's just it, this is just a simple example, but really require quite a lot of um, dialogue and open mindedness. Um, off the shelf doesn't really necessarily mean ready to use. Okay, you can get a good uh, sort of like a library, write three lines of code, and it runs. But from there to sort of like something which works well, there are a lot of options to consider and a lot of work to do. And please don't follow all the white updates. Maybe some of them, but not all. Um, again, there are so many options nowadays in the way in which you can get some text and get the label and try to make them match. Um, just be aware that you can spend then the rest of your life just trying out what you know the new tweet uh, is saying, oh, this is a new method is working really well, try it out. So be aware, don't follow all, all the rabbit holes. Um, yeah, the, thanks again for having me uh, and please do get in touch. Yeah, thanks a lot. That's really interesting. Uh, I have a few things, but I'd rather see if anyone else has some questions first. Okay, then I'll then I'll start. Uh, think about your questions a bit more. <laughs> um, you showed this example before of like the chain restaurants at, mm. as third places and some things like that, which you don't really get from the, from the data you look at. And you might also not get this from the people you interview. So how do you merge these things? How do you merge the, the pure quantitative? How do you merge the qualitative? And how do you merge your expectations? No one of your interviewers uh, interviewees probably would use this third place term they would describe it differently or not describe it that way at all mm. and how how do you yeah how do you make sure that this is actually usefully linkable it might not be the same people that send out the tweets or this is a narrow topic so it might be better to use foursquare but no one uses that anymore so how how do you actually bring in some validity into this merging I think that I think the answer is that you need to go again. I think is a mental shift that if you want to work in this kind of digital geography every day in particular, but general digital geography, a mental shift is necessary. And one of the first things that I found really challenging uh, with my working with my colleagues is to go beyond the um the concept of objectivity um so most of my colleagues uh that come from a social cultural background really completely reject the idea of objectivity so there is not a search for objective there is no search for an ultimate meaning of a tweet or an ultimate um you know meaning to attach to a place um the people we interviewed are definitely not the people who are tweeting about this kind of things um most you know, most people 15 years old don't use Twitter, um, but um, there are some. Um, and again, looking around the tweets, you is yes, most people on Twitter are, you know, basically me, you know, um, white tech savvy in their 30s or 40s, you know, and so on and so forth. But not everybody is. Um, and there are some very interesting looking at, if you look at Twitter, there is literally everywhere. It's maybe a minority, but there is literally everything from, you know, local um, North, you know, uh, <laughs> local rapper from a North side of town uh, to, you know, 
people like me tweeting about, I don't know, strikes uh, at the University of Leicester or something like that. There is, you know, there, there is literally everything. And I think um, is that melting pot of ideas and melting pot of perspectives that we are really interested in when we talk about the everyday and especially multicultural studies. So is actually going beyond the idea of creating a valid objective um, sort of like final product, but literally looking at the contrast, looking at, you know, what we can get out of, um, what we can get out of uh, the quantitative methods and what we can now qualitative methods. And again, it's like a lot of what my colleagues uh, highlighted. So yes, they highlighted, you know, people talking about Nando's uh, in a very cheesy and very happy way, but they also picked up on some very, as I say, uh, uncivic, um, what they call uncivic attention. So it's like not very sort of like very, um, very nice comments about anything else that's going on, which is not me, sort of like comments about other people in Nando's, um, which in, in a way that a, probably a, you know, a software tool for complex data is will never find out. Because again, all the tweets we use, or all the tools we use are very limited in terms of understanding the context, the language, and the sarcasm, and so on and so forth. Uh, and a lot of the tweets, you know, I'm not native, I'm not a native English speaker, and I'm not, I've been in Leicester now for some time, so I'm starting to understand, but a lot of the tweets really use their own language. You know, it's not just, it's not just a different language, it's just a different way of using English, um, which is not, you know, it's not the, you know, BBC news article, if you see what I mean. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Um, if maybe just one short question then uh how how would you say you start with uh with the work here do you start with the little observation you make somewhere in there is it something you so how do you start with the quantitative or the qualitative side for some of the impact uh, the impacts or the insights you showed here uh, mm -hmm. you always kind of have a have some sort of starting point some sort of trigger to to look at something in a bit more detail where would you say that comes from in your work? I think the starting point for this project was, well, it was just a chat. Actually, it was a chat over some um, census statistics during um, during a um, an open day. So my human geography colleague had just had a discussion um, with some of the students how census statistics is problematic and I was and then I was me just talking to them about how useful census statistics is then we sit down and I was like you know we should probably talk about this um, and then when we started the project I think you know the, the the first thing we did is just sit down in front of you know Twitter on a on a screen and start looking at it and trying me trying to explain how I would uh, approach looking at this and then trying to, um, you know, explain how they would do it. Mm -hmm. um, and still, two years after, um, almost three years since we started the project, um, there is a lot of discussion going on. Um, and you, again, you sometimes need to um, be very open-minded and trying to understand that point of view. Uh, if you have not, if you have never read um, sort of like critical human geography from a social cultural perspective. It can be quite challenging because some of them are not very open-minded about quantitative approaches. So you need to take everything that they say with a pinch of salt, and you need to try and understand their point of perspective um, and try to understand exactly. To me, it took me some quite a while to actually understand why on earth you would want to, you know, look at the what, what they call everyday geography. Why is that important? It takes quite a lot of time. But the first step is really to sit down and look at some what we would call data and see and try to understand how they approach and how we approach looking into the same the same information basically. Okay, yeah, it's always interesting to see where things start and how they especially these interdisciplinary things start up. 
uh, any other um, questions? Yeah, may, maybe a last question. So thanks for this very interesting keynote first. Um, so I think the, the quantitative approach and the qualitative approach are sort of very much complementary. Um, and so my question is, from your experience, how would you uh, pinpoint um, the merging process of both of them? Merging? Yeah. So we sort of, yeah, you also say you need both yeah. perspectives to some point, but I'm always asking myself how I can successfully and, and usefully combine both perspectives that mm -hmm. actually might be quite different, especially when your data-driven approach um, is, yeah, follows a certain schema that itself has biases, right? I think, again, um, we're, one of the papers that we are writing uh, is actually exactly about this. How do you go about doing this? Um, it's it's a really uh, one of the, the points that I was saying before is like one of the aim of the project was also to have a self-reflective, uh, self-reflection about what we did and how we did it. Um, and yeah, one of the paper would be about how you do that. And the, I mean, the short answer is that um, you need an iterative, open-minded approach. So as an example, I will go back to um, the coding that we did for this project. So we started originally, I, we say, okay, we want to look at the emotions and the context of multiculture. And they went away and I, I, I select sort of like randomly selected the tweets, but not quite randomly, they're sort of like a longer process, but I selected some tweets. And they went away and they looked at it and they coded it. And then they came back with a sort of like a relatively messy Excel file. And we looked through it and tried to, you know, make it so that I can actually, you know, use R to actually look at it. Because again, it's like, some of them, they don't have this kind of like, the, the, their approach to working with tools is also very different. Um, and then you sit down and say, okay, this is, this is not gonna work for me. What can we do? Can we, can we narrow it down? How much? And then there is, is, there is this, this tension about when, where is the point of which a labeling process or a coding approaches is still workable from a quant is becoming workable from a quantitative perspective and still kind of meaningful from a qualitative perspective. This kind of, for instance, eight emotions is, is sort of like borderline pointless for some of the human geography analysis because it's just too simplistic, okay? There is a process of, um, it's a process of simplification, which for them is very painful because it is actually, you know, uh, is drawing out all the interesting bits for them. But at the same time, drawing out some of the differences allow us to actually look at more data. And again, there is always a tension whether that is useful or is not useful. And this is why this is something that we try. It's not something that we necessarily work. I think the reason needs to be much more work. But I think that again, the starting point to combine quantitative and qualitative method is trying to decide on a project or an idea to develop and then sort of like have a very quick pace, not quick pace in the sense to verify, but very frequent discussion and iterative approach. It's like go away, do something, let's talk about it. Then go away again, do something and talk about it. So. And it, it really necessary. It's if you start out with, okay, we're from the beginning, just doing, we were gonna do this and this is what we're gonna work. This is not going to work. What you need is to develop the method together, really. Wait, it's not a simple you. answer because it's not a very simple process. It's something that I've never tried before. It's, you, you just need to have, you need to have an, an a, a you know, a colleague that you like to work with from a human geography and just try it out, basically. Yeah, thanks a lot. So far, we can move the rest of this to the discussion session. I think it's it's really interesting also to, to see how we can get these deeper insights, even with less massive uh, quantitative data. 
Um, we have to move on to the next paper, but I hope everyone can join the discussion session later on. Uh, then uh, if you can stop sharing your screen, uh, thanks again for joining us and for the very nice presentation. My pleasure. Then we will have Martin Bullin uh, talking about exploiting geodata to improve image recognition with deep learning. Uh, welcome and the floor is yours. So you should see my presentation? Yes. Okay. So thanks for the introduction and uh, thanks for the first talk. I was always looking for the bridge to our topic, and I think I have some starting point where I can step in and probably we can discuss it in the discussion or in the time for the discussion after my talk. So I'm Martin Bulling from the University of Bamberg. I'm working at the Chair for Media Informatics under the supervision of Andreas Henrich. And I wrote the paper together with Christian Arbinger, who unluckily it does not have time today so i'm here to present it and i hope i will be able to answer all your questions as well so what will we talk about if the presentation is going on yes um i will give you a short introduction about the motivation why we did what we did so why it uh, seemed clever to include geodata to images then um, how it is in uh, science, you always have to have a data set and it's hard to find data sets with geodata and annotations as well as the images itself. So we had to make up our own data set. So I will present that one. And then we tried out different methods because it was a quite new approach and we wanted to see what is working best. And afterwards, I will show you our best results or the most impressive results and then conclude about those as well as give some future research what we like to do because of the results. So I like interaction as well. So I have one small interactive part for you. And who thinks that the picture was taken in Paris? Just raise your hand with the raise hand feature or wave on the webcam. So one hand there, then I'll give you a second picture. Who thinks that that one is taken in Paris? Still one hand. <laughs> okay. So I wanted to raise, I don't think that the second one is actually, that looks more like Las Vegas. Okay. <laughs> So the first one is Las Vegas, and the second one is uh, truly in Paris. You can see it if you take a close look at the top, there are the letters Eiffel Tower restaurant. So that's the false friend here. And that's, um, I think, a nice example of what uh, geodata can do if you include them in deep learning for image recognition. You can uh, distinct visually similar images of different classes. And another point of the motivation, which is quite typical for deep learning stuff, is reducing training time because it's always good to have less training time and as well improve the classification performance. Normally, those two goals don't go hand in hand, but we thought if we add some more information to the network, um, probably we can achieve both. And for me as a scout, uh, one point is as well reducing the used energy because deep learning is kind of wasting energy. And if you can make that one greener, that would be a nice goal as well. So what about our data set? Um, we made it up from the Flickr crawl based on Musili Sergi from 2014. So there is a database with a lot of uh, links and meta information. And we chose 25 classes out of those. So we crawled them with the keywords and then grouped them into eight groups. So we got uh, overall around 170,000 images and around 7,000 images per class. And for the groups and classes, we had some uh, concepts in mind. So it's not completely right, but the geospecificity and relevance is going down for the table. So we had a uh, geospecific like the Eiffel Tower, where we had a radius of five kilometers around those. And then we had less geospecific and bigger buildings like the Golden Gate Bridge with 10 kilometers. And so we went on with, for example, Renise with 25. 
Then there is the break geo relevant ones are the most geo relevant in my, my eyes. So the Route 66 is a nice example. It's 4,000 kilometers, but it's small through the US. And then one really big one is South Africa as um, some geo relevant class. And we thought about adding some concepts as well. So not only point or areas, um, but concepts like beach, you have distributed over the whole earth, but um, the geo information probably can be helpful there. And we had some artificial ones as well, which are linking, I think. And some groups which aren't that related to the geo information with vehicles, flora and fauna. I think elephants, airplanes could be kind of geo related and are some concepts as well, where you will find uh, birds, dogs, and cars nearly everywhere. And we will see that in the results as well that the um, geo information aren't as helpful. And another axis there could be a size global distribution. So uh, first are the small ones, uh, and then we are getting to more distributed um, classes. But those axes aren't working completely. Just some small overview of uh, the distribution of the images. The first one, so the top left, is showing the complete data set. So the data are kind of um, condensed in Central Europe and the US probably just uh, uh, because of the nature of Flickr and who uploads there. Then the second one, probably you can guess, somebody, I guess. Okay, it's uh, the beaches and you uh, can see it's uh, mostly on the beaches here. And then the third one is quite easy, I guess. It's the Eiffel Tower in Paris. And then again, the a fourth one in the, the corner right down here. I can have the laser pointer system. Yeah, it's the Route 66. You have some outliers in Germany or in Central Europe, and that's mostly some restaurants with signs of the Route 66, which are uh, there in the data set as well. So that's about our data set. Uh, what have we done with the data? We um, added some information to the data set. And the first approach was just using the raw coordinates. So you see here, we have one method with the really straight raw coordinates. And we tried another approach with clustered coordinates as well with the DB scan. Then another approach was uh, because we thought about if you have uh, buildings and um, normally the satellite images are looking quite the same. And if you take a look at those four here, the satellite images share more content than the original images. So we had um, networks trained with those as well. So one only the satellite images and then we had uh, different approaches for the fusion as well. So one late fusion approach where the satellite images were trained in an own CNN and the normal images, and then they were fused at the end. And in an early fusion approach, the features got fused quite early, and then one network was trained with the features of both images. And the last Big method was an adding text data. So there we have some link to the uh, talk before. And here we use two different approaches as well. So we had uh, the user tags, which were in the Flickr data set. And then we had some radius and took the user tags from the images surrounding the geo data from the um, actual image. And as well, we took some. Uh, geo data via reverse and geocoding via the OpenStreetMap API and um, yeah, use those data in another network to train the model. So we overall looked at um, those eight networks. We had some more, but in the paper we only focus on those because those were the most interesting in our eyes. 
how does it look like? I think we have an, a similar image and uh, uh, slides before. So we had just here the image. Then for this uh, network, we used the longitude latitude, and those were fed in a multi layer perceptron. The image was given to a convolution net, in this case, an efficient net before. Then the features were concatenated, and some layers were following, like the fully connected and the softmax. And then we got our prediction for the classification. We use transfer learning like it is normal to use a pre-trained model. And uh, so getting shorter training time, we can think about if we trained eight networks and some more. It's taking a lot of time and we don't have so much uh, computational power that we wanted to train it from the base. And normally you get a better result if you're using pre-trained as well. And we used uh, always the same pre-trained convolutional net for all the different um, models so we can rely on the results. Yeah, so the final mix models were based on efficient net. We also tried mobile net. I think it's not written in the paper. And we as well tried a newer version of efficient net, but the differences between the, between the networks weren't that big, so we just stayed with the original efficient net results. So just for the people who really like to dive in, I have included the setup of the network here. I think you can find it in the repository as well, so if you want to rebuild it, I think uh, all of the code is online, so you can reproduce the results, but you would have to crawl the image data set because we aren't allowed to upload the images. And uh, just minor note for the model with the coordinates, it was not completely raw. We normalized them and then fed them into the multi-layer perceptron. What was coming out of the... Um, of the models is listed here. And I highlighted the three lines which were most interesting to us. So first, the raw coordinates, so where we only fed the geo coordinates, uh, is improving all measurements, increasing the loss, and as well the training time. So for geo relevant classes, you see um, it's uh, definitely helpful to take the coordinates. You have less training time and better results. And if you take a look at the satellite images only, so where you completely uh, neglect the normal images and only take the satellite, there is an improvement as well, but the training time increased hugely, probably because um, the network isn't focused on satellite images, the, the pre-trained network, so it's taking more time. And for some classes, this isn't working out. That's why the loss is increasing as well. So for the dogs and so on, there are the satellite images just not helping because uh, how should you uh, catch the dog? It has to stand a long time then. And the most interesting one are the address data. So where we added the addresses and in, um, in the second network because we have the best results here over all of the measurements and the training time reduced most. So it's the fastest approach with the best performance increase as well. So we fulfilled two goals here. And if you're taking a closer look, probably you won't see the numbers, but you don't have to because uh, uh, two lines are important to me here. And those are the geo relevant ones. And if you're taking a look at the route 66, we first had 246 and then increased by around a uh, percentage, uh, yeah, some 30%, uh, 25%, whatever, a uh, big increase. And it was even bigger for South Africa, where the baseline had only 445 images and it nearly doubled for the um, predicting predict the classes with the mixed model with the raw coordinates with 688. So that's where the improvements are coming from. It's more from the geo relevant classes than from others. You will see it in here as well. So here are the geo relevant classes and there is the most improvement, though you have to admit it had the, uh, the worst baseline. So the tendency, um, if the results were already better, you can't improve as, oh, wrong 
you can't improve as much as you can do if the baseline is worse, but that was expectable. And another important point to us was, if you take a look at the satellite only and the satellite early fusion here, it was decreasing the results. So you had a worse uh, performance for vehicles and flora and fauna, but that's something we expected because there it can't help. Uh, yeah. So um, just some overview of what the geographical impact was and uh, what the baseline classified there and the mixed model with the raw coordinates. And it's uh, nice to see that for South Africa, for example, we have the condensed uh, points for the right classified images here. And they were globally distributed in the baseline. And we moved the, the F1 score from 0.48 to 0.92. It looks uh, similar for the Eiffel Tower, though if you take a close look, there are some outliers there, but the F1 score improved uh, highly as well. And for the Yosemite Park, we have it as well a nice improvement of around 16%, uh, 60 points. And those were globally distributed before, and now they are condensed here at the uh, coastline. So to conclude about those results, um, we had a mostly shorter training time besides the network's own with network only trained on the satellite images. The mixed models performed overall better than the baseline. And we had the best improvement with address data than the satellite images and raw coordinates. But you have to look at the trade off there because the raw coordinates are just there. And you can normally use it if you have it in the data set. So I think about smartphones uh, capturing the images with the raw coordinates. Then you can use it out of the box. It's harder to use it if uh, you're going over some. API or Facebook or whatever, because they are normally the information are uh, deleted because it's um, too personal sensitive information. And the best uh, improvement was it with address data or satellite images, but there you have to crawl images and it's making um, the process even more work basically. Then the waste of computational power. We have proven that there is kind of waste if you have the information for the classes. So adding the geo data, especially for classes which are geo uh, relevant, uh, makes the process more efficient. So it's uh, you have a better performance, you're faster. And if you think that the um, faster learning will need less power, I haven't uh, checked it. We are doing that in another paper, but then it's getting greener as well. What we have seen as well, if the so the impact decreases with the increasing of number of classes, that's probably because of the not as deep MLP or the small data set. So uh, an enlargement of this data set or deeper multi-layer perception or deeper or more layers after the uh, fusion could help there or combining with other features probably because we like to add some data to uh, our training. What could you do with uh, those outcomes? Of course, classification of geo-based entities like points of interest, cities, regions, that yeah, was really good, uh, really working out good. And in general, it's decreasing the false positives. It's quite helpful as well. Uh, what's on our scope? Um, we like to add other metadata. So camera data could help as well, not for the geo-based um, classes, but for other classes. And there, for example, the aperture, flash, whatever could be included. Probably there could be some combination as well or some pre um, classification and then having some networks afterwards. So you can assess more classes overall. Then uh, what's always helpful is a bigger data set to as well probably uh, classify more concepts. 
but it's hard to find the data set or make it up yourself. That's uh, why we have some drawbacks in our results as well. And there would be nice to have a multi-label classification or object detection. And if you look at some false friends in our results, you'll see the baseline classification here. It's uh, set river and the um, mixed model set forest because it had the help of the satellite image, for example, here. And same goes with the um, network who has classified the first car. And with the satellite image, it was, it was able to say Golden Gate Bridge, but actually both classes are true in both uh, results. So there are the multi-level classification or object detection would be nicer. And probably the results would have um, better performance as well because we have some false classified which aren't really false in our results. So I'm at the end. I took nearly the time I planned. <laughs> so thanks for your attention and I'm happy to answer your questions. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, any questions from the audience? Then I'll do a quick one. Um, I like that you showed the, the places where it doesn't work because that's always the interesting thing. Of course, things work most of the time if, if you spend some efforts, but then the, the error classes can be quite interesting or they can also be the parts where things break. Um, it, that also kind of fits nicely into what uh, Steph uh, presented earlier on of how do we understand things that are really happening. Uh, could you say something more about the, the error classes that you that you had there? Where can you understand where they are coming from, which pieces of the pipeline or of the data that was generated or how the photos were taken or anything like that? Um, so do you mean those ones or the false friends at the end? Uh, kind of both. <laughs> Okay, so uh, in that case, uh, we thought that uh, truly it has to be about um, because the vehicles and flora and fauna are just classes which aren't um, that related to the geo information. Dogs, uh, cars, birds aren't limited to some space and especially they're moving. So for satellite images and so on, there the information can't help. And that's why we thought it's decreasing here. And as well, the baseline was quite good. So 0.86 and 0.73 isn't a bad result. So there isn't so much space for improvement. And if you take a look with the, there are improvements as well, especially with the address data, which have improved most or all of the classes. So yeah, that's just nature of the classes, but we wanted to include some classes in the training process, which uh, won't benefit so much. So we can see some tendencies there and we have proven that we are, uh, can have bad results as well. <laughs> and for the false friends here, yeah, it's, just the nature of image classification. If you have um, only one class per image, um, then it will classify one. And in that case, we just got the wrong one. Though it's visually not the wrong, you see some river here. So there are really a multi-label classification would be nicer, but um, we had to make up the data set and it was easier to have a um, single class classification and use the label text there. Okay, sounds great. Uh, and yeah, that, that also fits nicely into what do we really what do we really want as a result? Sometimes this uh, this can be yeah a bit a bit tricky if we have limited outcome categories or other items like that. Thanks for that. Uh, Steph has a question. Yeah. Um, so I had a quick question whether. Um, you consider um, as a sort of like as a ba additional baseline um, to just because comparing 
because you're using addresses and location of the photos, what would happen if you just um, use a, I don't know, even something like the 1NN or KNN or, you know, the nearest neighbor um, label as a label for the photo just based on location or the address? How would that very, very simple approach compare to um, sort of like the complex approach you have it would probably, you know, because most of the photo, if you if you know where the photo is being taken, especially if you, you know, uh, the Eiffel Tower, uh, the the tags that you would have associated with the play with photos taken at that place would be sort of like probably very fit into you know a new photo taken in that place. So even just taking something like a K nearest neighbor in space um sort of like how how do you think have you considered that as a baseline or uh, do you think would work how do you think it will work so actually we had the tv scan clustering as well we tried i think knn for pre-processing uh, for the coordinates and there was no improvement compared to feeding the raw coordinates or the text addresses so that was kind of confusing as well because we thought a pre -pro processing and clustering could condense the information and make it easier for the network to guess. But actually that wasn't helping at all. What, what I was suggesting uh, uh, was just use like literally without the deep learning network, literally just just the, using the coordinate and the tags from the next photos. We haven't tried that. It would be interesting to see whether uh, what, what, that would be sort of like a really low baseline I think that would be would be interesting to see a, a comparison with that. Yeah. Good. Thanks everyone for the questions and the discussion. Then I would say we close this session. Thanks to all the speakers again. Um, we have a short break. We went a little bit into the break, but I think that was a quite nice discussion already here. Um, and for the next session, uh, that should be a new uh, Zoom link. So we're going to close this one. And for the next one, please find it on Hoover again. It's easiest if you just search for LockWeb to find the next sessions because there's a lot of stuff happening in parallel. So see you back in at uh, 10.45, or well, in kind of eight minutes, whatever your local time zone is. Good, thanks a lot, uh, see you in a bit. Uh, then, welcome to the second session of LockWeb. Uh, we have planned two papers and then a discussion session to continue also some of the interesting uh, discussions and questions we had in the, in the first session with one paper and the keynote. Uh, we still hope that the second paper will make it in here, but otherwise we have more time for discussions. Um, and we start with the first paper which uh, Jens Halber-Wales will present on anonymous hyperlocal communities and what they talk about. So the floor is yours. Okay, I hope you can see the screen now. Yes. Alrighty, then let's get started. Hello, welcome. Next like 20 minutes, hopefully. We're going to be talking about um, contents in anonymous uh, hyperlocal communities. And, and the spotlight for today will be in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I'm Helga, a PhD student at BTU in Brandenburg, and this is Chuck Mock with Oliver and Niklas together. First of all, thanks for having me here at the workshop, I think, for the third time now. Uh, thanks for organizing this year's iteration, although it might be smaller than others. Um, and thanks, of course, to the reviewers for that feedback. As a disclaimer, I didn't have too much time to prepare for today, so we'll see how timing turns out, but let's get right into it and start with the short motivation. Um, thanks to internet, like short messaging and social media dominates our everyday communication. And honestly, there's um, lots of related work, but most focuses on the S and the U markets. Um, or they don't have any specific distinct communities. Um, we find main messages, small world networks, and power laws, uh, whatever. In this work, uh, we want to focus on the Yodel application, uh, which combines two key design, uh, design features. That is anonymity, 
and hyperlocality. So content is only displayed uh, to users in close proximity to their spatial uh, region, therefore forming independent communities. And this sort of made us wonder, given the very same ingredients, what do users talk about in this application and what's the intent of a commu communicating with, with others on this application? So some words about the app first, and as displayed here, uh, most important are, for example, the community. Where are we we're currently participating in? There are different content feeds displaying contents, and we have the actual threads where people start shouting out, people can reply within them, can up and down them, and so on. So you might ask, uh, why do we look at uh, Saudi Arabia at all? So uh, it's the second biggest community on the platform, and it's it's a spatially very different region than the European market we, we usually have. Further, it creates distinct communities uh, by design. And um, yeah, they want to figure out what people uh, talk about, what the topics are, and what the tens of them are. Therefore, we uh, create a systematic approach in evaluating this. Um, first, um, some related work. Um, Hyperlocality does not exactly mean location-based social network. The location-based social networks uh, drive around certain locations, but people are not bound to this specific location. So this is the first very difference. And there have been lots of surveys on applications like GitGag or Whisper that are pretty much alike Yodel. Um, lots of qualitative surveys, and they find it's used for information and entertainment. Uh, we have uh, lots of self or uh, general supervised learning approaches. Uh, people find statistically very ephemeral communication. Um, some don't find lots of personal information, others do. Um, yeah, and there are spatially uh, topic distance between possibly different communities. I was respect to anonymity. Um, most of them do not find lots of toxic content. Um, others do on anonymous platforms like 4chan. And yeah, the anonymity possibly might be used to get into broader topics and it might be more personal. That's at least what others find. With respect to topics, um, other sites are about dating and sex, uh, local life, weather and, and uh, education work and so on. And as for the intents, we have uh, personal admission, confessions, observations, information sharing, seeking for interactions, and so on. What all of this rich related work has in common, uh, mostly focus on the EU and, and US markets, right? And um, that is, when we look into specific cultural environments, um, that might be different. As we have shown in another paper empirically, um, in Saudi Arabia, Yodel is used vastly differently than in Germany, for example, and there might be pretty much differences. For example, um, the freedom of speech, according to Amnesty International, is questionable in Saudi Arabia, and um, people are using the internet as a window to an open and unrestricted world, so to say. So therefore, that's, that's quite interesting. But um, let's first define what I mean with hyperlocality. So um, posts and replies that are the main objects people interact on the system. And they are bound to very specific locations. So if we imagine the user uh, on the 2D map um, that participates, creates a post bound to this current very position. And now we have other users which are in proximity in a certain radius, and they can see all these posts within their community area. And therefore, then can communicate to it, uh, with it, um, interact with it, and they keep the reference to this very post. Um, yeah, for the data set and um, Saudi Arabia, um, we have ground truth information from the operator. And as we can see on this uh, heat map, uh, there are, there's rich engagement with the, with the platform, especially within cities. And uh, this creates lots of communities and we randomly sample texture contents and we also have hashtag occurrences. Um, and further some metadata, but this is not used in this presentation. So further, uh, what was very interesting with Saudi Arabia, when we look into the development of how the platform is being used, and therefore we'll show a uh, plot over time and the system usage and interaction volumes. That means uh, how much interactions do we have to, to this platform. 
And we see very abstracted, um, there is sort of a steep usage increase, like a sigmoid function, right? And that was kind of very weird what was happening there. Um, and therefore we want to, to find out what people are, for what people are using this platform. So we had this massive wall of Arabic text and we didn't understand what's happening here, especially to this, yeah, kickstarting behavior that made us wonder what happened. So our approach to these intents and topics we want to uh, get into um, is by creating a content classification schema. Uh, this sort of nicely connects to our keynote from earlier today. Uh, we did some crowdsourcing campaigns and of course we evaluated this. So for the schema uh, designer, our first goal was at, of course, fetch the intents and topics. So these are two different uh, questions. And specifically, um, classifications carry an inherent trade-off. So we want a very good coverage. So there might be some class for other. Um, it should be very small. We don't want to have overlapping classes. And yet we want to have a minimal set that still is of use and, and uh, suffices to, to to carry enough information that's useful to us. Uh, we begin with prior work and did some iterative refinements and random samples. And lastly, we arrived at a study design with two different coders uh, that annotated threads for us in, in multiple runs. And this required uh, some work to get them tuned into the, to the classification schema and sort of uh, misagreements, for example. So this was lots of work. Uh, we used a self-deployed uh, system for classifications like seen here. So you get the YODL and the very content and people are asked questions about them and could, could then simply provide their answers. Okay, uh, enough for that, uh, let's get into the results. Um, let's first uh, focus on the intent. So why are you using people this platform? Um, as given here. Uh, note that the seeking interaction information uh, is, is in the set or the class that largely includes um, seeking information and location related content that's not specifically modeled in this classification schema and the topics. So what we find here, uh, it's pretty much in line with related work as we have found so far and the coverage could be better. So we have quite large other classes. Um, yeah, as for quality, we also looked into uh, the agreement of our annotators uh, with the equipment of alpha metric and sweating. It was mostly substantial, um, at least for the intense and at times only moderate for topics. Um, but we also have lots of qualitative annotator feedback. So they say this is mostly non toxic. Um, these are probably young people and teenagers, but we can't verify that. And most are are seeking interaction for games or, or to the other sex for chatting or whatever and burning time essentially. So this might be one aspect where uh, such a data-driven approach might not capture all these specifics that are in the data that might not capture this, this everyday life as Steph has called it, right? Um, okay, but um, how is this then reflected in the data? And therefore we want to take a deep dive into the confusion. So as this multi-annotator confusion matrices within intents and topics um, as shown here. And don't get confused by all these numbers. Uh, first, we see straight diagonal in the intent confusion. And these values are relatively low in comparison to the topics, which are quite higher. Um, nonetheless, some of these confusions might be explainable, like the general entertainment and entertaining observations that are quite similar and that might indicate weaknesses in our schema. And there are others that possibly may not be explained that well. Um, so the precision could, could also be, be much better. But overall, uh, no model is perfect. <laughs> uh, that said, uh, we next take a uh, look into uh, results from a city perspective as we are on the long workshop, right? So apart from our results, we looked into um, the differences in topics between Jeddah and Riyadh. Those are the biggest cities in Saudi Arabia, where uh, Riyadh is bigger and Jeddah is a little smaller at the coast and at least believed to be a little more liberal and, and open. So we uh, plot the intents and topics as a heat map. Uh, 
um, where the z-axis denotes the relative differences in the probabilities, uh, whereas blue denotes there's more content in red and pink more in, in Shadda, right? So we look at these heat maps, it looks pretty much like a wild scatter, but if we look at the aggregations and take the averages across these classes, we can see that there is a tend in, in Riyadh to be or to, to have a broader spectrum of, of various topics, right? Uh, whereas Jada, on the other hand, uh, focus more on, on entertainment, so to say. Um, but as said, somehow this classification schema only uh, gets, gets a feeling what people are generically talking about, not this everyday life. And thus, we also um, want to take a look into uh, hashtags that we were provided with. Right? So this, this is going to be fun. Um, as for the top used hashtags, um, we have lots of them. Don't get confused with it. For example, we have this self-admission and, and self-expression in, in confessions. On the confession chair, for example, it's quite popular. Um, others um, want to use or exploit the system to to gather karma, which is sort of um, a lightweight gamification within the application. Uh, but to be honest, largely this is about matchmaking, uh, triggering interactions, especially with the other sex and so on, uh, which which brings us to the story of of happy marriages. Um, along popularly used hashtags, we, we find quite of insights like uh, things about kissing, things that, that turn you on at women or at, at the other sex, for example, uh, generally about marriages, hopes and fears, uh, debating about being a single or not, and why, matchmaking, conditions for marriages, and uh, even behavior during sexual intercourse at the first night of marriage. And so on. so that was quite fun. And that this is or reflect sort of the feeling, the quarter feeling from our uh, coders that we have uh, lots of teens and teenagers talking using this very application. And that is particularly not reflected in the classification schema as, as we designed it, right? Uh, so this already brings me uh, to a short summary. Um, quite briefly, um, we created an annotation schema for the intents and topics and we crowdsource these annotations. And we show that, um, yeah, it may have been better, uh, but it's, or at least we argue it's fine for some qualitative insights, right? Um, our findings are mostly in line with related work. We are fine, so there's largely no toxicity at all, like on Fortran. And probably the communication even here is rather ephemeral due to anonymity. Um, but it largely revolves around entertainment, social venting, self-expressions, confessions, observations, jokes, uh, local information sharing. And this possibly might also be due to being anonymous as um, this opens up the, the opportunity to, to share very personal things that, that happen on the other as well. Um, we also identify, um, sorry, um, in homogeneous uh, spatial communities. So there are differences between communities as shown for Jada and Riyadh that, that are essential, right? This is not just simple numbers. And um, yeah, maybe if we increase the, the sampling rate, this might adjust, but I believe they won't. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm already sort of through with this. Um, I hope you enjoyed this talk, although it was shorter than expected. and. I sort of know it opens sort of more questions than, than it, it, it provides answers, um, but it was a quite interesting journey. So um, sort of lastly, if, if I did the study again, would we do it differently? Um, yes, definitely. Um, but I would also like to put emphasis on how much work it is to, to develop relatively a schema that works quite well, because always with each new version, you have to test again, see where do we have certain confusions or disagreements we need to discuss. And this is a quite lengthy process. And uh, it brings me to the point that, yeah, crowdsourcing can be hard or is hard. And yeah, it already begins with the questions we ask. Yeah, do we catch this everyday life or don't we, right? Um, yeah, check out the paper for more. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, you uh, can also take a look at my website. Um, so far from me, thanks for your attention. 
And I guess now we have even more time for interesting discussions and your questions. Good, thanks a lot. Uh, any questions from the audience? I see clapping, maybe some raised hands. Yeah, Steph. Hello, hi. Well, first of all, thanks for the very interesting, uh, for the very interesting talk. I think there are, again, some, as you said, some interesting um, overlaps or some interesting intersection with the kind of discussion, the kind of approach um, I was having. Um, can I, can you, this, I mean, you, you said just now that you had um, some discussion with, or some level of discussion, if I understand correctly, um, with how the crowdsourcing of labels went. Can you describe a little bit, I, I'm interested because again, the kind of, uh, the kind of approach that we have used in, in our, in our study, it was, it, it was not, it was not really crowdsourcing, it was like, you know, my colleagues actually doing their work, me using that as uh, sort of like as labels. Uh, so I would be more interested to uh, understand how how you experience this process of getting this kind of this kind of labels, and how would you how do you think it, what would be different if you had the people if you were not crowdsourcing but literally be able to sit on the same table with the people that were doing it and try to have a discussion with them? Um, actually, we did. Um, due to the data set we obtained from the operator, this um, has high restrictions on how we can use this specific data. That includes that we cannot use some crowdsourcing platform like Amazon Mechanical Turk or Microworkers, um, but the, the annotators we use must be affiliated to our university due to these legal constraints, right? And therefore, we employed lots of different um, students um, having having a background understanding Arabic coming from Syria, or Saudi Arabia, or Egypt itself, or from Oman, for example. And we actually did engage with these very annotators. So. Um, I guess we learned it very much the hard way. So we had a first student or two students actually that were qualitatively looking into the content. That we're scanning the content, getting a feeling what's what's happening there, what are people talking about? And this is where we dove into this wall of Arabic text where we hadn't any understanding at all. And um, yeah, and therefore we we sort of created some kind of classes, first classes, try to put things into there, try them out, did they work well, what are missing classes, what are other things we would like to catch or not catch in this data with our classification scheme. And this always is sort of a decision process and trade-off, do we want to include this or not, and does it benefit or do we need it? Um, until at some point we realize it's quite hard to put everything into just one class of topic. And this is where we came to the point, and also by examining more and more related work, we sort of need to split the, the intention a user, why a user wants to or post a certain post. Uh, we need to split this from the actual topic. What, what is the topic about? Because those things were heavily intertwined. And, and mm. yeah, I think we came up with a solution that uh, worked quite well, but this actually is a very hard task coming up to this very point. And this is also a thing where I guess I would do things differently. Would I have to do it again? <laughs> How would you do that differently then? I guess I would. Um, so we started very much bottom up from, mm. from the content that there was. Of course, we didn't know what the people were talking about. And therefore, this was certainly at least not the wrong call. Um, but I would. Nowadays, focus more on what do others do, what do semi-supervised learning or totally uh, unsupervised learning algorithms display and show what are other results that made sense in a certain way and sort of derive this top-down and refine this, um, yeah, like in the top-down approach, I guess, this would have been a little faster in the end. <laughs> but that's just, just my personal feeling. But then the question becomes, do you want something which is um, faster? And again, uh, there was discussion before, 
some faster and maybe more quote unquote objective using a top down approach or is maybe that what I'm trying to say is I think there is a value in the messiness uh, and the difficulty sort of like try, going through the difficult steps that you went through. I think there is a value in that, that you, you learn a lot about the sort of like what you are actually trying to understand rather yeah. than taking a, a pro this is a little bit again the the i think this is something that in our quantitative approach we are missing in the sense that we normally uh in a way or another take a crowdsourced approach or not everybody but you know we will either work with um again not everybody i don't want to over generalize but very frequently either we work with a predefined benchmark or we say okay we let's you know uh have crowdsource or our do our own coding uh and in your case what you did is very similar to you know again what we did and going through a very yeah. difficult painful a slow process of actually trying to create something that can work for you know for the content, but also from for the algorithm, and I think there is a real value that I think we tend to um, sort of like throw under the rug when we write up the papers and the talks. So we tend to you know um, sweep under the rug all these difficulties because it don't it doesn't look sufficiently scientific, scientifically. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I think I, there, I, there needs to be a discussion about this. A recognition that is actually part of the process. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, so this actually was so I switched workplaces uh, like a year ago, and this is actually older work, but I didn't find the time or had the the drive to write things down. Um, as I said, or I thought this was only just a simple classification. There's we got some results and then we got the bar chart nice and that's it but um to be honest and, and i later realized and especially while writing this paper down um that actually is lots of work that has been put into this for creating the schema and i think all people that haven't been doing any crowdsourcing yet uh, do not know and do not appreciate uh well-designed crowdsourcing campaign right um yeah, and that's the pains we go through, I guess. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Thanks for that. Any further questions? Okay, I also see that on the online system on Hoover, there are more people joining this than we see here in the Zoom uh, overview of participants, but I have no way of checking any questions that are coming that way. So, uh, Julian, maybe if you can have a look on that, if anything comes that way. Yeah, maybe a last story. Um, we also thought about leveraging our classifications for doing a supervised learning tasks, uh, applying mask language modeling. <laughs> that didn't work out at all. So I guess we just had, didn't have enough data, for example. So. If you want to try to do that, I mean, technically, Arabic content is harder than, than any well fit pipeline that's used in English and, and well available. Um, yeah, but that was uh, at least worth a try, right? Okay, great. Thanks a lot for this. Uh, and yeah, good luck with, with following up on this. Uh, just the language topic, but also the, the general topics you see there and the get, getting this data really uh, for, for, for more interesting insights. Uh, surely something we'll hopefully hear more about in the future. Then uh, we can go to the next paper. I see our speaker is, is now there. Any issues might have been resolved now. So Welcome. Then we have uh, the next paper by Him Jim. I hope I pronounced the name right. Um, on predicting spatial spreading on social media. I see you here in the participant list. Uh, if you can 
unmute yourself, turn on your video. You should have the rights to share your screen. Yeah, actually I have to share my screen. I'm searching like it's not showing me the option to share my screen. Okay, uh, Julian, can you can you help us? I don't have the option to add um, in sharing. I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work, to be honest. But let me double check. Hmm. Well, the, hmm. everyone should be allowed to share their screen. Hmm. Uh, you don't have the option for share screen at all? No, I'm not seeing the option. I'm seeing the option of sharing content. That is showing photos, website, and whiteboard. You're using the Zoom client, the standard one? Oh, yes. Mm. Okay, I only see that all participants are allowed to join, to share. Like uh, uh, sh share content by Google Workout. Let me check. Oh, there's something happening. Oh, no, it's not working actually. Hmm. Yeah. There is something coming, but it's uh, just white. Yeah, it's uh, no, it's actually not working. In a worst case scenario, you could send me the slides and I will show them. Okay, so uh, from where should I share the slides? Uh, I will send you an email address. In the chat box, should I share the URL? Um, sorry? In the chat box also, I can share the URL. Oh yeah, that would be perfect. I don't see anything in the chat. Yeah, I'm just. Can you just uh, click on that URL that works or not? Did you share something? I don't have anything yet here. Um, I have shared in the uh, chat. Oh, on the, uh, um, I don't see it either. That's, that's strange. I don't know, maybe I am doing everything in a wrong way, that, that is why. It's not working. Oh, you managed to share something in the chat on the website, not in the Zoom chat here. Wait, I'm sharing the, ah, now it's here, yes. Or maybe it just delayed or something. <laughs> Okay, so now you should at least see um, yeah. your slides. And if this, if you have any luck, I could actually share the controls with you. So you should be able to control my screen now. Could you test this? Oh, my mouse. <laughs> Mm 
Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Maybe you can full screen that. Yeah. Great. Okay. Thanks. So it's uh, probably not going to the next slide. Like uh... you should be in control now, um, basically. Okay. Actually, I'm not able to move the slides. Like uh, how to switch to first slide. Uh, oh, to the fourth slide. Um, well, it's changing. For me, it's changing. Um, I think it doesn't change backwards. Oh, okay. Yeah, there are errors at the bottom. Um, okay, okay, okay. If if you need to go backwards, I can do it. Just let me know. Okay, you just uh, you uh, just take the control. I will say the next slide, and you can go to the next slide. I will do. I can do it in that way. Like you have the control in your hand only. I would say just go to the next slide, and we can just say in that way. Uh, I'm not sorry. I'm not sure if I fully understand that. Could you repeat? Julian, if you can just if you can just run the controls for her, that might be easier. Oh, like. Uh, so I should um, advance us to the next slide um, on command. Yeah, we can do this. Okay, thanks. Good, then uh, go ahead. Hello, everyone. So I am Brimjan from Indian Institute of Technology, Patna, India. So title of today's presentation is Predicting Spatial Spread on Social Media. So spreading is like we have recently faced corona everywhere all around the world. So we know that it somehow originated from a place, then it traveled to another place. Or the very basic concept of the virus is like, if I have virus, I come in contact with somebody else, so that person will also get that virus. So somehow both the users, in terms of computer science, I'm saying both the users are getting infected. Or in terms of uh, normal uh, layman uh, language, we can say that both the persons are getting infected. So the phenomenon of spreading is like, like on social media, if you are posting something, suppose I have posted something on Twitter, so my friends would see it, maybe they can share it, maybe they can like it. So there is a, some kind of activity happening from other users on my post. So that is a kind of infection. Infection is like, it is like uh, information is sharing. So we call this as a social phenomenon of social contagion. Because if I'm sharing something on social media, then people or users who are seeing that would maybe they can just view, just like, or just read to it or just share. So somehow they're coming in contact with that information and they are just getting infected with that information. So the basic idea is whenever we talk about sp spreading on social media, so we generally do all the analysis and all the researches on the base on how this information is spreading between users or what should be the time gap between the spread of information. So this spread has actually three main parameters. One is volume, as I have said. So volume is like how many users are infected, like how many retweets are there, how many likes are there. So these are all one kind of volume. Another uh, parameter of spread is time. So time is like uh, in how many, how much time uh, information is going to be viral or in, in how many time this information can get thousand number of likes. So this is the parameter of time. But what I have seen in the past situation that very few have worked on this special spreading part because as the information is spreading among two users, it also spread between locations. Like if something has originated from one country, so they, they then that information can propagate to another country. So it is like information as it uh, spreads from one user to another user, it also goes to location to location. I think uh, you can go to the next slide. Okay, thanks. So here in the picture, I have shown two images. 
So in the first upper image, you can see the information is getting shared between the users. Like if a user has posted something, another user would be just uh, liking it or sharing it or just viewing it. So viewing is also a kind of information spreading on social media. But in the second figure, which is, uh, we can see that information spreads among the different regions or locations of the world also. So what happens uh, uh, with this special spreading phenomena is like, this is a very important phenomena because uh, like now with this advent of social media, we are now all global. So there is hardly any impact of geographical distance. So we are very close on social media. So we, so everything like, so, so I, I talk about iPhone, so it started from a country, but now every country, even the country which are having very low, uh, GD, uh, very low income, those are also having iPhones. So the things actually propagate and spread all around the globe. So special spreading is a very important phenomena. And we can also understand it's important from this spreading of coronavirus. Actually, it started from a few countries and it actually spread to whole world. So that is why the spreading phenomena uh, in terms of space, in terms of geography is very important. But since uh, we, we are actually, all of us are from uh, this uh, geographical information retrieval area only, so we know that getting uh, enough amount of data which are location tax is really difficult. So that is why uh, probably we have very less literature in this regard. So. Uh, a few have actually analyzed this uh, phenomenon of spreading, how it is spreading, or in what time, what is the pathway, like what uh, from which country it's originating and it's going towards which country. So these things have been analyzed, but prediction have not been made in terms of uh, space, like how uh, can we predict the special spreading or not. So can we go to the next slide? Yeah. So the main motivation behind uh, the spreading studies of spreading, special spreading is like, at times it may be required to manipulate the spread. Manipulate means like, uh, if something is very good, suppose you are doing a political campaign, so you would like to expand it. So we'd like, you you would obviously want to expand it to more number of countries, but if something, if there is a rumor or some negative thing is there, so you would always try to inhibit that spread. So at times it may be required to manipulate the spreading. Again, in term, if I talk in terms of applications, so there are many applications of this spreading like uh, targeted marketing, targeted advertisement, because we know that every geography has every location or every country or even few states also within a country have their own culture, their own way of thinking, their own activities. So we need to have a location based uh, um, advertisement or location-based recommendation. So that is why we need to include geography in terms of spread also. So as I have said that volume and time has been analyzed, but space, there is still uh, lots of space, lots of gap to work in this domain of special spread. And for the past models, which have actually tried to predict the sp uh, spread, have uh, mostly focused on time and volume, like predicting the future, or number of free tweets or predicting the future number of engaged users like that only. But special spreading has not been, uh, not been predicted. So in, this is a short paper. So here I have uh, made an attempt to predict the special spread. So this is uh, not very comprehensive, but still uh, we are working on this uh, project. So can I move to the next slide? Can I move to the next one? Yes, okay. So uh, what problem which, uh, the problem statement which we can uh, define in terms of special spread is like, uh, in this uh, uh, paper, we have actually predicted the special spread of hashtags. You know, uh, for every uh, post nowadays, we are using hashtag, like hashtag the web campus, hashtag log this. So hashtag are now uh, a very important kind of topic modeling that we are using nowadays. So uh, this study is based upon prediction of special spread of hashtag at an early stage. Early stage means like if something is spreading, so if something has started this spreading from today, so maybe it can spread up to some amount of time or up to some number. So it is like we have to predict at an early stage what would be the final special spread. So 
Now we need to quantify the spatial spread. So we have a lots of metrics. We can use lots of metrics, but I have used focus metrics. So focus is nothing but the maximum probability of occurrence of a hashtag at a particular location. It is like, suppose I'm giving example, a hashtag has occurred at three locations. So for one location, uh, the, the percentage is maybe 60, for another location it's 20, and for the third one it's 20. So it's 60, 20, 20. So maximum probability would be 60. So that, that location is that 60% uh, is actually the focus value. So as uh, like focus is the value on the basis of experiments and past work, we have seen that if a hashtag is having a higher focus, so that is mostly a local event. If the hashtag is having lower focus, like if the hashtag is having just uh, 0.2, so that is a global kind of hashtag. So final problem statement, which we are doing in this paper is like for a given hashtag, we have to predict the final focus at an early stage. And for early stage, we have limited the number of initial tweets, that is to 50 tweets. Why we have limited this to 50? Because if we are limiting it with the time, like we can also say that in first hour, we have to predict or in first half an hour, we have to predict. So it may happen that uh, there are some viral hashtag and in the first uh, hour only it has it has gained like millions of tweets. So time is very uncertain, but if we fix the number, like with initial 50 tweets only, we are going to predict the final focus so that um, actually is more practical. So that is the final problem statement, uh, which I have solved in this paper. So can we go to the next slide? So focus, I already told that this is the maximum in intensity of geographical spread of information. It is like just, it is a probability that how probable it is, like maximum probability of occurrence of a hashtag at a particular location. So whatever analysis I have done is in this paper is based within a country. Like I'm saying global, but it is within a country that is uh, for that country, it is global, but it is actually nationwide. So we have actually collected data for uh, uh, this. This uh, in this map, you can see that this is map of India. So as I am from India, so it's uh, very easy for me to visualize the things like how this is happening. So what I have shown in these two maps in this slide is like uh, first one is on the left side. We can see that uh, this is the this visualization of spatial spread of one hashtag. So this hashtag actually, we can see that this is con the spread is concentrated in a very, uh, very few number of states. You can see that only one or two states has maximum number of uh, tweets. But in the right figure, we can see that the okay the number of uh, tweets are distributed. Here the red dots are the number of tweets that user who have tweeted location of the two, two users who have tweeted these tweets. So this is uh, spreaded uh, mostly uh, all over the country. So we can see from this, both the figures is like uh, the left figure is a local one and the right one is a global one. But again, I would like to say that uh, past work has mostly tried to predict the spread in terms of volume. So volume, if we use the uh, models which are actually trained or which are particularly uh, created for predicting the volume that may not work because as uh, in this figure the first uh, figure uh, is actually a local one because the, most of the tweets are coming from a single state of the country but we can see that i have also stated that the number of tweets are actually 98000 more than uh, 98629 so it's like the number of tweets is very high so it then again it's local only but for the second, that is the right figure, we can see that the number of tweets is actually less, but still it is global. So we do not have any very strong correlation between the volume and the uh, spread. So it's not very obvious that if something is uh, having very large number of user base or user engagement, so that would be global. It's not like that. So the past model may not work. Okay, can we go to the next slide? Yes, so this is a data set data that I have used for my experiments. So our aim is to predict the final number, final spatial spread, that is the focus metric with initial 50 tweets only. So this, this, these are the three data sets which I have collected. One data set is from Geotag tweets of India. 
another two are already available data sets which were released released uh, during this uh, covid outbreak so this, this, this is the basic data sets so can i go to the next thing okay fine so for uh, for solving this problem actually i have what we have considered is like uh, probable features which we have considered so the consider features can be divided into three categories we have considered social features emotion features and special features social feature is like uh, adoption lag it is just like if a user has uh, tweeted something and another user is tweeting after that user so what is the gap between it? what is the time gap so it is just like speed of the spread so somehow with this adoption lag we are capturing the speed of the hashtag how it is propagating follow time it is like uh, the no more number of followers you are more spread you, your hashtag would be spreading more so we have used this follow up count also retweet count uh, retweet count is like retweet is uh, also one of the important parameter of spread so that is why we have used this retweet another thing is like emotion features because uh, it can happen that maybe some content are having some particular kind of information uh, emotion that may work so these are actually probable features which we we have used but the feature set can all uh, can always be extended whatever from intuition or on the basis of application or on the basis of data set only another set of features which we have used are special features in special features we have used the metric focus in copy spread geographical distance so focus i have already said that focus is the Uh, probability of occurrence, maximum probability of occurrence of even uh, at a particular location. Entropy is the randomness, like how random, randomly that uh, hashtag is spread. Uh, spread is spread is just job, uh, average job, geographical distance. Suppose it, it is spread in, in five uh, locations. So what is the average geographical distance between all the five locations? And geographical distance is like what is the A geographical distance between two continuous tweets. So how we have designed our problem is like we have initial fifty tweets. We have arranged all the fifty tweets according to the timestamp, and then for each tweet, like we have uh, tweet one, tweet two, tweet three, we have calculated each features, and each features are concatenated. So it's like if fifty tweets are there and we have one feature adoption lag, so we we would be first. Uh, making this feature up for adaptation lag, so it would be of size fifty. And again, appending another feature like follow account, so it would again be of size fifty. So like this, fifty plus fifty plus fifty, up to the number of uh, features which we are having in this data set. So this is about feature uh, creation. What how we have created the features of the data. So can we go to the next one? Yes, so I am really explaining that. So we we are having initial fifty tweets. So for one feature, like focus feature is there. So for every tweet, we will calculate this feature and make a vector of that feature. So again, uh, another feature is there. So a vector again a vector. So uh, uh, finally, we are concatenating all the vectors. So if we are having suppose ten number of features, so it would be like fifty into ten size vector final vector size. So can we go to the next slide? Okay. So, uh, it is like we have calculated all the features. In features, I have already calculated the feature focus also. But what? Uh, it is like it is just for the initial fifty tweets. The final focus would be something different. The final final focus which we have considered in this problem is according to the data set. Like we have not limited the hashtag with uh, time or any volume. We have just considered the uh, the. Overall, all the occurrences of the hashtag in the data set, so that is bounded by the timeline of the data set. So that is the upper limit of the uh, occurrence of that event. So for capturing the feature, we have just considered initial fifty tweets, and for the final prediction, we have considered all the tweets associated with that hashtag. So actually, we are predicting the focus, which is somehow representative of the spatial spread. Now, since uh, focus is a continuous value, we have converted this uh, focus to uh, uh, to classes. Like we can just put a threshold. Okay, uh, if the threshold is less than zero point four, so that is a global 
hashtag if the threshold is more than 0 0.2 so that is a local hashtag so uh, in this day we have converted this problem into a binary classification problem so again we have trained this binary classification using five fold cross validation and we have evaluated this problem on the basis of this common matrix these are standard metrics that is accuracy micro accuracy weighted accuracy score okay so can we go to the next slide and these are the results which uh, we have obtained. So we have actually experimented with three data sets. Two are from India, one is from USA. Uh, so there are two baselines which are recent uh, techniques for predicting the spread in terms of volume. So we have implemented those baselines in terms of spatial spread. And again, we have used other off the shelf machine learning algorithms like uh, logic segregation, K nearest neighbor, naive base and uh, decision trees, random forest. So from all this experimentation, what we have observed is that extra trees are giving the best performance. So, uh, and the, the range of accuracies are actually high. So what we can conclude from this uh, short study is like, spatial spread is really an important phenomena and it is really predictable because the range of accuracies are good and it is um, more than state of the art which are trying to predict the spread in terms of volume. Okay, can we go to the next step? So the final conclusion, uh, final conclusion is like it's uh, uh, so the results from extra trees algorithm is around 11 to 21 percent higher than the state of the art uh, spreading prediction uh, uh, methodologies. And we, we have also observed the tree based algorithms like this is into random forest and so these are giving better performance. And the range of accuracies, as I already said, that it is high. So that means that uh, the problem is actually predictable and we can work into this problem. So, can we go to the next one? So, uh, that is all from my side. So, conclusion from this uh, paper is like special spreading, prediction of special spreading is somewhat new in the literature. But this is important because uh, this has lots of application because for every study, like we are, whatever study we do on social media, so we have another aspect of that study which include location in that study. Also. So, spreading is just like that. So, but uh, really collecting data, data and having sufficient data for any study is difficult, but a uh, few studies are there which have actually tried to study the phenomena of special spreading, but this is the, from my knowledge, this is actually the first one to predict the special spread. So we are still working on this problem. So we would just send this problem using some other, other sophisticated machine learning or deep learning algorithm and that is all from my side. Thank you. Great, thanks a lot. And are there any questions from the audience? Either here or the ones on Hoover that I can't see, unfortunately. Uh, yeah, Helder, go ahead. Hey, hi, uh, first of all, thanks for this very interesting talk. Um, I myself uh, have, have worked on, on this very topic uh, by myself. I think we had a paper on this um, at this very workshop in 2019. And there we uh, we used the orig original work from Kamat et al um, using spread entropy and the focus and extended this into a temporal dimension. Have you thought about integrating a temporal dimension? Because this then gave us insights that there are on these dimensions, the, the spatial threat and the temporal spread. Um, there are like four distinct groups of uh, very short-lived local phenomena, longer-lived local phenomena, um, the, the, the global events like Germany's next top model, whatever. And um, yeah, these short-lived uh, and these long-lived global means, so to say. So this might be an opportunity to integrate some more information, levering temporal data. Yes, actually, time is uh, one of the important parameters. So this is actually a um, preliminary study, so we have not included time. But the issue is like whenever we are trying, like whatever we think, uh, like we are thinking, okay, this is the time parameter, we should limit by time or we should include this. But every time data is not there. We have this constraint of data. So data availability is really an issue. 
And second thing is like, even if we have data, so that data is not verified by our large set of community. Suppose we have collected the data. So we need to justify that data set also. So for my case, I have collected one data from Geotype India. So like uh, publicly available data sets are also very rare. So data for this kind of study needs to be very dense. If it's sparse, so maybe the predictions would not be correct. So uh, th that is why uh, till now we have not included all the aspects. But yes, time is very important aspect, and we must include that. I agree with you. Yeah, sure. Da data set is is a problem. Yeah, I, I do understand that. But yeah, keep this in mind just as a tip. I think there's much to get from, from the invention of time as well, especially in these spreading scenarios and when you also look into the uh, like spreading modeling and so on. So quite an yeah, very yeah, yeah, interesting okay. topic on itself. So yeah, yeah but yeah, thanks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, thanks for the suggestion and thanks for understanding my problem. Any problem other questions? Yeah, yeah. Then I would have a question. Um, can you explain a bit what the different examples mean that you showed? What sort of topics there are? Where does your approach that you have presented now work already well? And where does it fail to work? Like uh, failures, it is like when I was doing this study, so I started with a few hashtags. So at that time, like uh, it was around 30. So I tried to train machine learning models. So I did it with all the basic machine learning models and deep learning models. So with uh, just 300 hashtags, it was not able to predict. So predictions was very less. So then I decided what should I do? Then I started in, uh, increasing the number of hashtags. First I collected just data for one month. So for Twitter also, whatever data is there, they just give one person. So if I limit that again with the location, like if I collect it from uh, India only, so again, it would be like uh, one person of that one person. So it's very less. So, so that was the issue. Like if the number of hashtags, like number of training data is really less, so it's very difficult to solve the problem. Second thing is like class imbalance problem can exist because if I, I'm keeping the thresholds very high, so maybe the global ones are very high. So the, the training examples are very few for that uh, threshold. So I have not experimented, like in this paper, I have not experimented with different thresholds of this uh, uh, selecting the local and global hashtags. So that may lead to the class and balance problem. And uh, another problem is like this is this study is within India only. So we need to do on global basis, like predicting all the things for global hashtags. So with this, these are within country studies. So these are the two examples. Okay, thanks. Uh, and maybe quick, quick final remark. Um, could you say something about this local versus global uh, distributions? Which one, which one is easier to predict, or which has different? What are the different characteristics? I would assume that something that's spreading over, over a small area looks quite different. Also, looks to something that kind of pops up all over India, more or less at the same time. Does that influence uh, your approach with looking at the first 50 tweets to say this is now enough to do a prediction? Is the first 50 already spread out or is it localized? How does that look like? Okay, so it's not that it's uh, really predictable with 50 tweets only. So we can try with at least 10 tweets or maybe 20 tweets. So that is only an experimentation process. Actually, for a comprehensive study, we should try with different number of tweets, like 10, 20. And we should also try with different time, like first half an hour, first one hour. It is like that. And for this global local thing is like, it uh, actually depends on the threshold. Suppose I have taken an average, like the focus metric is between 0 to 1. So if I take the threshold 0 0.5, so most probably it would be the distribution would be like half of the hashtag would go into local part and half may go to the global part. So that depends. So, so if we have enough training examples, so if we have enough number of local uh, hashtags and global hashtags, so both prediction of both would be 
equal. But if we have very less, suppose if I take the threshold 0 0.9, so the hashtags which are having focus greater than 0 0.9, so there would be less number of hashtags which are having that uh, focus. So maybe uh, with uh, less number of uh, training examples, the model cannot learn. So again, we have uh, we can have some other methods like active learning or learning, or few short learning. So we our focus is not on the including more sophisticated machine learning part. We, we, our focus is on like, we should be able to visualize like we are predicting the spread. Okay, this is a spread, so somehow we are predicting accurately. So that that is what I think is the aspect of local and global prediction that depends on the thresholds. And again, for a comprehensive study, we need to experiment with all the thresholds. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, then uh, first, I'd like to thank all the speakers of this session and then also the previous one. And then we can go into more of a general discussion. Um, again, Jim, could you mute yourself? You do have a lot of background noise. Yes. Yeah. Um, so what we, what we talked about so far was a little bit on the issues of, yeah, what does the data really mean? Uh, some issues with the data set, uh, the, the importance of temporal uh, in here as well, actually in the, in the last year, we had merged uh, this workshop on location and the temp web workshop on temporal analysis. Uh, and there, there is quite a lot of overlap there as well. And the, the issue of are the data sets good enough for the questions we actually want to answer um, is also quite an interesting one, especially if we look at large scale things that we need to do uh, yeah, quantitatively. Then also the, the keynote of Steph before is quite interesting to see what can we do in a qualitative way, which means we kind of have to go there and we need to spend a lot of uh, resources on, on, on the researchers actually doing this type of work. So where's the threshold? Or how can we merge this better to really get the insights we want? And especially also for the location data, a lot of these, a lot of the issues that came up in previous years were around granularity of the data that we are not just not sure exactly if we have granular data for the actual questions we have or if we have to loosen up the questions a bit to still make things work. Uh, yeah, maybe uh, just to follow up on that, uh, what do you, how do you see that influencing your own work? Or what sort of how, which which of these items has shown up as the one of the more heavy influences of how you do the analysis or how you even shape the questions that you think you might be able to answer? Um, if I may start, I guess yeah. um, both dimensions, the spatial dimension and this temporal dimension, are very important and important carriers of information. Um, as such, I, I think both dimensions are very important um, to be used in the best case together to leverage the whole extent of what they can, can display. Um, as you mentioned, of, of course, there is a problem of what kind of granularity do we have, especially with regards to locations, as uh, at least most data is, is well timestamped nowadays. Um, Yet, I guess, for getting a first overview and understanding an empirical set, I would often like to first take aggregates on, on the spatial data to understand the, the underlying distributions. And then on, in a later step, I find it easier to, to look into different um, temporal uh, shifts, for example, in things. But it might also be just a person of favorite this way, one can do it also the other way around. And also, um, it's very apparent that it depends on the problem you are solving. So if you want to, I think, do some statements, some, some general statements um, about communities, for example, their behavior, you're always good off doing the spatial split first and then doing analysis on, on the timeline, because these also often appear to be um, much harder, I think. Yeah, that's my two cents. 
Yeah, thanks. It it it's absolutely it is an is an issue. Um, where quite often also when you dig deeper, you realize that some questions cannot be answered with the with the level of data you you have, or that it's just something that's quite hidden. Uh, in some cases, you can throw some deep learning at it to still get some residual information. Um, what we also see in some cases, you mentioned that timestamps are quite nicely done. That's kind of built into most of the systems. The geo stamps are not it also shows if you look at well twitter data as an example not that much is directly geotagged you cannot really trust the geo tags that are in there because you can also set them yourself or kind of default them to somewhere and yeah estimating it from the content because there's not that much of it also just the geo tagging or geo parsing is quite tricky as well so in many cases we have much less data that we can reliably tag with or with the with a certain likelihood uh, which again makes geo data a bit more difficult to work with because just there is not that much of it even if we think more of it would be pro probably located but then you have to do manual analysis uh, this kind of goes back to the to the overall thing uh, also that came up before, there was a lot of bias in how data is generated and there are large areas of the world where we just don't have a lot of uh, generate data available. And then a lot of these things fail. Uh, they work well in large places, LA, New York, London, and then they break down into smaller places. Um, for that, I also liked the, the analysis earlier that uh, Steph showed of well, not tiny places, but smaller than, than the usual mega cities where, where there is just enough data and you don't really care. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I think um, in terms of the, the two things that come out, came, came to mind where we're talking. Um, the first one, exactly talking to back to what you were saying in terms of being able to answer the question you're asking. I think there is a big difference between, um, well, to be the, 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 going back to the definitions of digital geographies that I was mentioning before, whether you're trying to do um, some geographies of the digital, in the sense you want to understand something about the data that you have, or whether you want to do um, the geographies, uh, well, it's not quite what they mean, but you want to do geographies through the digital in the sense you want to try and understand something about more general geographies using digital data so is there is difference whether i want to understand something about twitter using twitter data then twitter is perfect because it exactly exactly what i'm trying to understand if i want to understand an earthquake through twitter then twitter is biased because it's not representing the whole of uh, the reality that i'm trying to understand so I think there is a difference there and there is there are questions that are, you know, I want to understand how people react to an earthquake on Twitter, then you get all the tweets and that's all you are or you want to look at. If you want to understand something about the earthquake itself, then there is a bias. And so I think there is a key difference here about on a conceptual level what you're trying to do. Um, in terms of time, I think there is um, the the the. the, the um, the paper, uh, the work that I was presenting before that we did uh, looking using ge uh, graph convolution neural networks uh, to represent the spatial temporal dimensions of, of, of the content. I think some of the, the interesting discussions that um, we did around that and, and really not quite ended up exploring that aspect, but I think there is some even there interesting as interesting implication about how you conceptualize time in the sense that you can conceptualize time as something linear uh, and then times becomes sort of like you, you have distance in one dimension but time can also be circular so you can explore you know whether you can explore things how they happen um, every day throughout the time or seasonally or weekly and then you start having different aspects of time so you know whether something has some uh, daily regularity, some weekly regularity, some seasonal regularity, or it just happens throughout linear, linear time. I think different 
um, different questions require different conceptualizations. Um, and I think that that it's it's quite important understanding also what kind of what, what you can do with the data you have. Mm. Yeah, and I think there also your perspective is quite interesting to to look to look at it from from that side. In but in many cases, it's the the, the data is just a more or less bad proxy for something we actually want to look at. Usually it's, in many cases, it's about understanding something about the real world. And then whatever we have is, the data is a bad proxy. And just being able to understand a little bit more how bad it is can, can already help. So understanding what bias is in there, uh, especially in cases where there is no other ground truth that you can compare things to. We see it clearly in some of the in some of the distributions of where media or social media happens. You see that there are wide empty areas. There is an old XKCD joke where all analysis looks like a population map in the end. It's totally not true for a lot of the social media analysis. It's very biased to specific areas on the world. It's not related to population. You might do that in the US. There are clearly a lot of things just show a population map again. But on the on the broader scale, or also on in other countries, it, it's it's very different again. And being able to just be aware of that and maybe use this to to make a better analysis is, I think, quite valuable. And there is still kind of a gap in the in the work or in the literature of how to how to better assess that. Yeah, I heard it. Um, yeah, I, I totally agree. So in, in, in any data set, we have uh, lots of biases, even in the Twitter API, I don't know, 1% or whatever. This is like heavily US focused stuff. And um, we are lucky that we have access to two data sets that are uh, from Germany and the one from Saudi Arabia I was talking about earlier. And in a different work, we, we just set a view of an empirical view on these communities and already there we find um, very significant systematic differences in how the users uh, use the platform so there's the recipe is very same um, but for example in Saudi Arabia users uh, focus a lot heavier on creating content participating whereas here in Germany at least in this very contrastive comparison study um, users were like lurking, sometimes voting up or down. But this 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 sort of extends to to a meta finding. If you talk to any people from the MENA countries, um, they engage differently to social media. They are very affine to it, and this is often very often disregarded in these very very interesting and yet very cool studies that we see a lot. Um, that there are differences depending on on backgrounds, on, on culture, on, on whatever. So we don't know, so this is to be found out, but this, this is particularly important. And I think, um, of course, most works of or authors are aware of their bias in the data set, but this often is not openly discussed. It's, it's just said and, and everyone thinks, okay, that's the best we can do. <laughs> Um, so it would be nice to see in the future more works from, from different regions, like from India, from China, um, where we have lots of population and there's massive usage of social media as well that we don't see in, in research to the extent it happens, right? So, yeah. Yeah, and I think there also, it's like, if, if, even if we are aware of the bias, it's kind of a very dim awareness. We don't really know how bad it is, maybe in some cases. We see that there is not enough data in the way we want it, but if you if you throw a broader net, you might find some additional things and you have to put a bit more effort in. But being able to really understand, to, to better understand or maybe even quantify this uncertainty, it's, it's quite hard. And there's a lot of work on generally where, how bias propagates through systems. Uh, but I think in some cases, we don't even know what what the uncertainty or the bias or whatever we want to call it is in, in the input data that we are able to collect. Yeah, I think um, some of the work that I was showing before, again, that you mentioned on uh, well, on London and uh, and Los Angeles, it's 
it's interesting in a way that you if you it, any way you narrow it down, there are still biases. Even if you narrow it down to one single city, then there are biases in who is working which which social media. And I think the work from you know places which are not uh, North Europe or the US are actually quite interesting because they go in and look in, in like in the paper that we have just uh, listened to, uh, they go and look at the local content on you know platforms that are actually used there, whereas we tend to uh, focus on what we know. I mean, we, we tend to use Twitter because it's available mainly. Um, and, you know, unless you have access to uh, to some other content, it's really difficult to do research on social media. And I, th I think there is, a, again, a risk, especially in sort of like more computer science prone disciplines like GI science to try and do, trying to do something which is general or generalizable and then try to apply it again on you know London to Twitter in London and then say okay this this works uh, but it's not really I think it is important as you say try to do some local some more local studies some more uh, you know non, try to admit that it's not necessary that every paper that we do need to be said in the world we can actually do some interesting paper on a local content and a local on a local topic mm -hmm. uh, in terms of the bias one thing. I wanted to mention is the work of Anna Baziri, who is currently, is, uh, she's a professor in Glasgow, and she's looking at missing data. Um, I think there are, there are some interesting questions to try and solve that, trying to look at the data that we have, and like similar to what uh, we did for London and, uh, and Los Angeles, try to compare it with sort of like more generalizable data set but again it's very difficult because sometimes you have some point of reference that you say okay this is this is what the data should look like thus this is what is missing and who is missing and there are also i think some as you, uh, i was listening to her uh, a, a keynote uh, from her at the gizra conference just a couple of weeks ago and she was talking there about the fact that there are also some ethical issues because if i'm not contributing if i'm not contributing content maybe i don't want to be seen i don't want to be there um so is it ethical for us to actually go and look who is missing if these people want to be missing but then the question becomes are they missing because they want to be missing or are they missing because they have no opportunity to contribute and to be part of the discussion so i think there are again multiple dimensions here yeah absolutely and what i was thinking now also when you said that was there might be a kind of a step change and at what level you look at things you get you get different biases being more being more dominant they are always there but which are more dominant at what at what scales of for, for which questions you might you might move from something that's more spatial distribution or uh, spatial bias and if you go further in you get the yeah bias of inclusiveness or participation or any other any other categories of who is actually then participating or in which way that would that would be quite interesting to look at further as well i don't know if we have sufficient data so maybe uh, you need to convince your people to do some more on the ground interview work <laughs> yeah certainly interesting um I would like to follow up on this um, a bit more. Uh, what I also do is we usually write a quick note of the workshop in the Sikaya forum. So I'll try to summarize a little bit the discussion here as well to also see what are what are the interesting open questions that we're looking at. There is certainly a, a change over time uh, of what is what is urgent. Um, early on, it was mostly about only the data sets and granularity. Now we are moving into some of the more detailed and more tricky uh, parts. Maybe it also kind of fits with larger uh, streams on bias in AI and uh, in, in processing of things. So that's certainly interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll try to write this down, um, have a look at that once it's out, which usually has quite a long timeline for that. But also, I hope this uh, gives some some interesting ins inspiration for any future work that comes out here. 
And that also helps us to meet again next year in the same workshop. Uh, Helge, you had a, a hand up. Um, yeah, possibly a last thinking about um, data sets and granularity. So, well, most things are all time stamped today, but um, myself dealing with data sets, it's always complicated because you have to consider ethics and use privacy. And this is a very problem associated to this spatial data. Right? Yeah. If I have data and can track individuals on, on the square meter uh, over time, that might be very questionable. So there are certain different um, stakeholders here at play. And therefore, finding sort of middle ground is hard. So getting a data set with correct data is hard. And then responsibly using this data is, is additionally even harder because in the best sense, you would introduce some kind of anonymization or a one out of n anonymity or, or whatever, or apply at least some, some measures, right? Um, yeah, this keeps me thinking a lot. And um, as much as a researcher, I don't like these restrictions um, at times, um, they are important. And it becomes even more important in times of GDPR and, and the whole discussion about your digital footprint and so on. Mm. So yeah, this, this is also development over the recent years, I guess, that um, most journals or conference require you to, to state ethical things like at this workshop as well, right? And it's, it's the right decision to do so, it's applicable. Um, yeah, but this, this presents another burden for data, especially with uh, spatial detail, right? Yeah, that's absolutely true. And yeah, we put that in. I think I also gave you a comment on your paper on that. But yeah, the, the privacy issue is really strong on the location side, of course, linked to everything else. And yeah, anonymization for location data doesn't seem to work yet. It's unclear if that will ever really work. So it's quite, we have to be quite careful with data we, we have access to there as well. Yeah, but still, even without, with that, there might be also a good opportunity to turn this into, to, into an opportunity to still be able to do something that doesn't need or that fine grained locality on, on personal identifiable data and all that. Uh, because there might be different ways to do something quite similar to, to the question that's there. And it makes it also more applicable than in the real world. And we all have to, well, we want to know things about the real world. So we also have to yeah, find by yeah, some I'm, of the I'm, rules. I mean, yeah. I'm, I'm, I mean, sure, the, the solution as of today is to provide some, some course aggregation, like to linking users to cities. And, and this uh, is then presumed to be sufficiently k anonymous, right? Um, and I guess in most cases that's that's fine as well. So, but but going deeper than that, yeah, become, becomes questionable with regards to these sensitive topics. That's my only point here. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yes, then uh, I think there's lots more to discuss. Uh, we have to move that to something offline. Normally we would go for a coffee or dinner later on. Uh, hopefully this can happen next year again. And I'll keep following up on this. Uh, uh, let me also know all the others here if you have any interesting further thoughts and ideas. Um, I'll share whatever we'll write down on this one as well. Thanks everyone for joining. This was again, really interesting. So I will definitely try to run the workshop again in the next year if they let us in again. And have a really good week and hopefully enjoy some of the other talks in the conference as well, if we can make time in our busy schedules. Yes, thanks everyone and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs>